can we begin? Okay. We got this dog here. One second, brother. Let me take care of this dog. Hey, guys, welcome. We got a 16-second delay, and we have this uh, troll named T. He lives in a fantasy world where he thinks Muhammad is a prophet, where Muhammad raped women, raped women like his mother. Surah chapter 4, verse 24. Surah Tanisa, chapter 4, verse 24. Muhammad raped even married women like the Shia did to this guy's mother. And Muhammad treated women as prostitutes and whores, and he called it Zawj al-Muta. And Muhammad cursed people, and he cursed even an orphan girl. And he mounted a, 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 a nine-year-old because he's a pedophile, pervert. And after I debated Shabir, my first public debate, Shabir has ran for me, from me, like Aisha used to run from Muhammad when Muhammad would enter the house and she'd be playing with dolls and he'd mount her and violate her because Shabir, like Muhammad, they're dogs and Muhammad is burning in hell and Shabir <clears throat> is a dog who's been muzzled and that's why he runs. And T is asking me, I can't answer who Jesus prayed to. The better question is, in his book of porn, book of trash, his book of filth, chapter 2, verse 157, chapter 33, verse 43, chapter 33, verse 56, who does his Satan, the demon that molested Muhammad spiritually, pray to? Because it says Allah and the angels pray for Muhammad. Allah prays for people, as do the angels, and Allah's prayers are upon the pagan stone lickers, like this pagan, and again, being a son of the devil like Muhammad, he just lied about Joseph's age because, remember, these guys are possessed of Satan, molested of Satan, like Muhammad was. So they are lying, murdering bastards, according to John 8, 44. And the word for blessings in Arabic, it's baraka. But you see this clown, like Muhammad, who licks the black stone like Muhammad did, who's in hell, is trying to deceive you. The word for blessing is baraka. The word used here is salah, not baraka. So again, he's a spiritual bastard, son of the devil, son of the Shia, because he's a son of Muta, like Muhammad was. We spit on Muhammad, sorry, Lloyd, who's burning in hell. Glory to Jesus Christ. <laughs> sorry, brother. The demon started manifesting. I apologize, brother. Was that, did that wake you up, uh, Lloyd? Um, th yeah, that was unexpected. But... Yes, exactly. Because you have someone uh, manifesting in the comment section, mocking Mary, mocking Jesus, mocking you and me, because he's upset that you're going to show that Islam is from the pit of hell because it has Gnostic roots and that it influenced Masonry and Hitler. So glory Actually, to the... Today we're going to prove that Islam and Muhammad are funded by George Soros. <laughs> Even worse than we thought. <laughs> Man up to my heart. Brother, welcome to part two. As I said, by the power of Jesus Christ, I pray this will be an ongoing series because you have phenomenal material. I want the Lord Jesus to be mag magnified in and through you. And if I can facilitate, be used to introduce your material to a wider audience so that you can go viral for the glory of Jesus Christ and be supported, it would be my honor. Now, as you can tell, I'm a little under the weather. I'm suffering from allergies. Even though I'm taking allergy pills, it still doesn't work as effectively. So my eyes are puffy. It's not because you're so handsome and I'm crying because I'm not as handsome as you, but that's true too. So brother, Jesus bless you and anoint you. Continue where you left off. It's your show. I'm here to facilitate. Well, thank you very much, Sam. I'm very grateful to be back. I, I really enjoyed the last show together. And thank you to the audience for all the great chat, the great input, the great comments. Um, it's been a really wonderful reception. So thank you all. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so I'll tell you what, let's just dive in. I will share my screen. Yes, sir. Uh, so let me just start. Yeah. Sorry, guys, I'm under the weather, as you can tell by my eyes. So ignore me, focus on him. Okay, so since, okay, just so by the way, Muhammad al Ghazali is regarded as the single greatest Sunni scholar of Islam after Muhammad himself. And this is in his collection of hadith. And he tells us here that Aisha once angrily said to the Messenger of Allah, it is you who pretend to be a prophet from Allah. Oh, that's beautiful. Now, like... see, so this is from the Ikhya Ulum al-Din, which is regarded as 
the most read spiritual book after the Quran itself. It's on the book on the etiquettes of marriage. It's also in the Mukashvat al by Al-Ghazali. And of course, um, I would hate for T to call Aisha a liar. So, you know, it would be very, very sad if, if that were to happen. So just so people understand, and just to confirm what you just said, Hamza Yusuf swears by Al-Ghazali in this book. Hamza Yusuf loves Al-Ghazali. You're telling me Al-Ghazali quotes <clears throat> Aisha in anger saying, it is you who pretend to be a prophet from Allah? Yes. Okay. You guys heard that, right? Uh, amazing sources. Continue, brother. So I don't want to call Aisha a liar unless some Muslim wants to do so, but then they feel free. Please just drop that in the comments so we can, you know. Okay, so on to where we were before. So I'm going to go through a few slides. I've got about eight slides that I want to just touch on, which I skipped over previously, and then I will finish some slides in the middle, and we were very close to the end. So let me go back. To the beginning. Okay, so, <clears throat> okay, briefly then. So we are going to be talking about Islam as a Gnostic religion. I'm also going to be talking about secret societies like the, the Freemasons, the Shriners. I am going to be, we have spoken about his connection to the Nazis. Uh, Muhammad's at least Islam's connection to the Nazis, the Sufi connection to the Nazis. I have another discussion which goes into much more detail from the Salafis, where Muhammad promoted a Salafi to the position of general in the Nazi army. And few people realize that the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, of Palestine, volunteered to be a general in Hitler's army. He raised over 600,000 troops to fight for the Nazis. And in fact, few people realize, but the Nazi SS was a separate division, the Death's Head Division. The Nazis had an entire division of Muslims, which was wow. the largest Nazi SS division of all. So the largest wow. SS division was the Muslim division. My goodness. I didn't even know that. I know about it. The Mufti of Jerusalem visiting Hitler. But glory to God, this is going to be good. May the Lord anoint you. So, for you. Yeah, so that, that I don't have. This is not today's topic, but that's one I can touch on. And we can talk in depth. In fact, there was even a Palestinian youth Nazi party. <laughs> Oh, wow. So the 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 fake Palestinians, sorry, Palestinians, fa <laughs> they, they even had a Nazi youth party. Just so everyone knows. Okay, so so now we've okay. So briefly speaking, we are going to be talking about Gnostics. So let me go to. I'm skipping ahead just to some pages that we've missed. Okay, so briefly again, again this book against the Protestant Gnostics. It's a discussion by Philip Lee on the Gnostic influence within the Protestant denominations. Now, he writes here about Martin Buber, and he speaks of the perpetual enemy of faith in the true God is not atheism. Now, I have a full series on atheism, which is actually, well, that's a long story. Let me go on. But rather Gnosticism, which is the claim that God is known. Beyond that, it is the claim also that you are God, or that knowledge will make you God. Right? And he speaks of the two spiritual powers of Gnosis and magic masquerading under the cloak of religion. And we've been seeing that Islam happens to possess both the Gnosis and magic. Mm -hmm. And of course, Islam is a deen. In fact, it is a political system. In fact, let me bring this up. So this, that actually might be something useful to discuss and show people. It might actually be very, very helpful. So right, let me just, I'll come back to that in a moment. Okay, and then, okay, and of course, they speak of that the tribes of Jacob could only become Israel by disentangling themselves from both gnosis and mm. magic. So in other words, these are things that are entirely antithetical to the message of the Bible, but we will discover that Islam is entirely both involved in gnosis, it is a Gnostic religion, and it is entirely involved in the occult and magic. So any comments, Sam, before I continue? So Martin Buber, who was also known, and I've heard of him in the debates with Michael Brown and other rabbis, with the late Rabbi Emanuel Shoket, who was a harsh critic of Paul. But as a Jew, a Jewish philosopher, he says that the, the leading enemy against the Jewish religion is Gnosticism. So he affirmed that? That was his feeling. Now, I should mention, he mentions atheism. Now, atheism, few people realize, and I have an entire series on it, yeah. which I haven't finished yet, but atheism is, 
you've got the Enlightenment movement. So atheism as a modern phenomenon is only dating back to about the 1750s. So it's fairly new. It's about 270 years old. Atheism mm -hmm. claims to be derived directly from the Enlightenment. And if you look at the, for instance, if you go to the Temple of Satan and you look at the tenets of the Temple of Satan, the, the core tenets of the Temple of Satan, and you look at the core tenets of atheism, you'll find that they are effectively identical. So a few people realize that atheism actually was begun as a religious replacement of Christianity. So there's a great deal of information we can discuss another time. Yeah, please, but, uh, I'm free to come and do a series on that for the channel as well, by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God, you. continue to bless you. So continue, my brother. I don't, so, I don't mean to interrupt. If I interrupt, it's for clarification. No, that's fantastic. Thank you. So look, I'm just going to go off topic for a second. The word deen, Islam is a deen. It claims to be a deen. Now, they use the word religion. It's a convenience. But deen, let's have a look from. So there are two, the two major, just like we have the Oxford Dictionary, Islam has two major dictionaries, right? The Al-Qamus Al-Muhit, which is like their version of the Oxford. This one was the basis for Lane's lexicon. And there's another one called the Lisan Al-Arab. These are the two oldest and most respected Islamic dictionaries. So yeah. deen embodies perspectives on existence, life, society, and socio-political system. So it's a political system like communism, like socialism. It's a complete and competing ideology and a system of life and society that competes with Western values, right? So it's a political framework for managing mankind's affairs. This is what a deen is. We're going to look into this in a little bit more depth. There are four linguistic meanings for the word deen. Right, within the famous classical Arabic dictionaries, the Lisan al Arab and Al Qamus al Muhit, there are four meanings of deen. Let's have a look. The first one is subjugation and dominance, with meaning ownership, government, administrative, or legislative authority. This is entirely political. This is not religious. The primary meaning of deen is to subjugate and dominate, which requires force. It's political. Can you see this, Sam? Yes. Wow. So you guys are saying that the dean is to subjugate and dominate. It cannot be one of um, many equals. That's exactly chapter 9, verse 29 of the Quran. Correct. Second meaning is obedience and bondage. Mm. Subordination and dominance under the power of others. Now, by others, what they mean is you dominated and in bondage under slavery to the Muslims. Yes. Right. Next, rules and regulations like the Pharisees, doctrine, ideology, tradition, now notice, or religion. Religion is an optional meaning of deen. It is not a required meaning of deen. And then finally, reward and repayment, which is linked to justice and accountability. Your thoughts, Sam? Yom, yeah, that's the, where we get Yom al-Deen, the day of deen, where there'll be reward and repayment. So these are definitions so people can understand that you're not getting from Islamophobes. These are the standard definitions given from Arabic lexicons that are produced by Muslims and highly respected by Muslims. So people understand you're not just coming up with these definitions. Correct. So let's give you this uh, broader definition from these books. The first meaning is subjugation or dominance, administrative or legislative authority to put pressure to be obedient or using power to enslave or make one obedient. Mm -hmm. I subjugated them, so they obeyed me. I ruled or governed upon him. This is entirely political, it is oppressive, and it is totalitarian. The word Dayan is used to indicate a person who dominates and rules over a state, nation, or tribe. It is political, it is totalitarian. Mm -hmm. The second meaning is obedience and bondage, subordination and domination, by someone and bearing humiliation under subjugation and the power of the Muslims. Here, al din does not mean religion. It means obedience. Yes. Yes. That's in chapter 9, verse 29. That's why you're astounding me. The citations simply pick up what 929 says, that those who don't believe in Allah, <clears throat> nor in the last day, nor forbid what Allah and his messenger have forbidden, nor accept the religion of truth, they must pay jizya, even if they're the people of the book, so they can feel subjugated, debased, and humiliated. That's Correct. exactly and the definition given 929. Yeah, if I ever talk about uh, demis and jizya, I can go into a great deal of detail, far more than the Quran will ever cover, and you'll learn just how frightening demi, demi law is. It, is. it is incredibly disgusting, 
and frightening. And finally, just so you know, everyone talks about Islam as a religion, right? Now, in terms of that list, religion is 10th on the list. It is optional. You first have these, ownership, government, administration, legislative authority, subordination, dominance, doctrine. Everyone talks about verses. Doctrine is a lot more detailed. Ideology, tradition, then religion, maybe, then justice and accountability. And everyone is stuck at number 10. Exactly there. And this is just to let you guys know, there's another authority named Sam Solomon. He used to be a devout Muslim who studied Islamic uh, <clears throat> jurisprudence inside and out. Confirms everything Lloyd says. He says that Islam is a socio-political economic system and religion is a small part of it. To confirm what you're saying, his name is Sam Solomon, a renowned authority on Islam as well. I've lost contact with him, but glory to God for these facts you're producing. You are a blessing, brother, and you're exciting us. Ah. Thank you. Okay, so let me close that. Okay, so yeah, I'm not getting confused between my presentations. Let me close this one. Okay, so let's let me move on. So now I go to page 16. So Gnosticism has no positive vision of creation. Right? No, no, wrong page. Sorry, next page. Okay. So Gnostics believe in salvific knowledge, as do the Muslims, versus knowledge of a mighty salvific God. So in other words, if you follow the Sharia, if you do these things, you will be saved. Right? Now, of course, they speak of here, Gnostic salvation is not based on knowledge and of faith in God, but the Gnostics believed in works and the imaginative treatment of a private vision. Right? So the Gnostics are not attached to reality. And we've mentioned that the way that these major scholars achieve communion is by detaching from rationality and reality. They create their own reality. To know Christ was not in any sense to have knowledge about the historical man of flesh and blood, but to deny him, but rather to be personally related to the mythical heavenly being who liberates humanity from historical concerns. So that's in Lee. So the scriptures are discounted as history and reinterpreted as a springboard for speculation. Now, we know that this is part of the Islamic view as well. We can relate these. So, salvation is defined as an escape into the self where introspection brings true knowledge. The solitary nature of the religious quest is a continuing theme for Gnostic literature. There is no real need for the other, for communion with others, like in a church. The individual is a complete unit of faith and knowledge, which is now, think Oprah, you need to find your truth. Yeah. There is no your truth. There is the truth. There is your perspective. There is your limited knowledge of it. But there is the truth. And there is this your truth. This is a very Gnostic idea which has embedded itself into society. Wow. So we see the prevalence of Gnostic influence even today. And it's all around us. But because people don't know what Gnosticism is, they're not seeing these Gnostic uh, what we call cues, these terms that are thoroughly anchored in Gnosticism. So we're basically saturated in Gnostic <clears throat> terminology and beliefs. Yeah. Now, so the end result of the introspective search for the knowledge of God is that the God which one finds is nothing more than a reflection of yourself, your own limitations, a God of convenience, if you will. As Aisha said, Allah seems to hurry to answer your desires. So this knowledge divide produces a spiritual elite as Gnosticism does versus ordinary people in Christianity. We are just members of the body of Christ, the church, whereas you've got a spiritual elite. Now to repeat something that I've mentioned before, you've got the scholars who are more specifically the scholars of the religious sciences. They are the guardians, the transmitters and interpreters of religious knowledge, right? They form part of a religious community an elite that requires a certain level of expertise. And the ulama, are a permanent government behind changing dynasties. So now that tells us we have a religious elite. Let's continue. Okay, so 19. Now the Gnostics have divided humanity into different groups. The somatics, who are content to exist on a bodily level, and the psychics, who functioned at the level of mind, intellect, emotions, the common sense types, who compose the many in the church. Right? And they speak of the pneumatics, or the Gnosticoi, who are worthy of understanding the mystery. That is the scholars. We've spoken earlier of the Ikhshan, Ikhsan, right? The perfection of faith. And that is limited to the Gnostic 
elite and the Islamic scholars, right? So this is a very hierarchical view of humanity. So the Gospel of Thomas, which we mentioned before, right? It paraphrases the parable of the lost sheep. So the shepherd chooses to go after the one lost sheep because the one needs him, not because he's unconcerned for the other 99, as the Gospels teach it. But in the Gospel of Thomas, they flip that around. Upon finding the one lost sheep, the shepherd says to the sheep, I love you more than the 99. Mm. Because the other 99, you see, that they aren't searching for true knowledge. See? So this is, Allah only loves those who, you know, love him, who go look for knowledge. The rest are not important. Sam? Yeah. No, I'm listening to everything. And they're saying, for some reason, your link, I keep linking to your YouTube channel. It's not working. It's working for me. So, but so... I want people to see this in the Gospel of Thomas. Jesus' statement of going after the one sheep who's lost is now transformed, perverted to say that one sheep is the one that Jesus loves more than the rest. Why? Because that one is part of this Gnostic group because he's now receiving Gnosis. Is that what they're doing within the Gospel of Thomas? So within the Gospel of Thomas, the one who has knowledge. So this, this Gnostic allegory that they have, we will see that the one with the knowledge is far more important, worthy, far more than the rest, than the average who don't seek the secret knowledge. But we will see that as we go. Okay. Um, let me continue here. So we've discussed some of this. I'm going to just jump ahead. Okay. So the Gnostics tell us matter is evil. Now, this idea of matter being evil was an idea borrowed from certain Greek philosophers. Now, it went against Catholic teaching because it contradicted Genesis 131 and God saw everything they had made and it was very good, but also because it denies the incarnation. Now, if matter is evil, then Jesus Christ could not be true God and true man because Jesus, as we know, is in no way evil. He is the man who was born without sin and who lived without sin. Thus, many Gnostics denied the incarnation, claiming that Christ only appeared to be a man, but that Jesus' humanity was an illusion. Now, some Gnostics, recognizing that the Old Testament taught that God created matter, claimed that the God of the Jews was an evil deity who was distinct from the New Testament God of Jesus Christ. They proposed belief in divine beings known as eons, who mediated between man and the ultimate unreachable God. Right, Very similar to the Allah of Islam. The lowest of these eons, the one who had contact with men, was supposed to be Jesus Christ. So Gnostic ideas were all over the place. All of them were anti-Christian. So I take offense when people constantly say, well, Gnostic Christians. It's yeah. like, there's no such thing. Yeah. They are either no. Christians or they are Gnostics. It's like saying Christian, uh, Christian Aryans. No, they were Aryans. They were not Christians. They denied Orthodox Christian doctrine. That's right. To emphasize for them, I want people to catch this point of Gnosticism. So just so they got what you said, and that's why I'm just for clarification. A lot of people know of Gnosticism, some don't. The Gnostics, because they thought matter was evil, so that people could see what you're saying. So they believed there was a divine Christ, but he didn't become flesh. One form of Gnosticism, right? Right. And so the Old Testament God, who is said to have created matter, because matter is evil, that led the Gnostics to view the Old Testament God as a lesser God, an evil God? As Satan. Say it again? As Satan. Do you guys are hearing this? See, I want you to pay attention. In Jesus' name, please learn this stuff. He's given you top grade stuff that you don't even get in seminary. So the God so, of the Old Testament for the Gnostics was, was Satan. Can you elaborate on that for them? So I don't have my notes in front of me, but very briefly then. So for instance, there's one, I think there's one, I don't know which... Which, which verse it is, but you might know it, Sam, of course. They say that Jesus says to the Pharisees, to the leaders of the Pharisees, he says, you are of your father, the devil. John 8, 44, yeah. Okay, John 8, yes. Now, the, many of the, so an influential Gnostic sect back in the day took this, took this verse and they corrupted it. They said that Jesus said, you are of the father of the devil. Oh, wow. See, so instead of saying you are of your father, the devil, they claim that that Greek phrase was you are of the father of the devil. So the Jews are of the father of the devil. So Yahweh is an, 
is either there's even there's either a greater God who's more evil above Yahweh, or they are of the father of the devil. In other words, that Yahweh is a front man for Satan, but Yahweh or Yahweh is Satan, right? Wow. But but basically they you are of the father of the devil, so Yahweh is of the is the father of the devil, or he is the son of the devil. So this is the kind of interpretation they placed. And lots of people, lots of scholars try to push this idea. And therefore, Christianity is evil. And the, the biblical God is evil. Thank you for the clarification. I want people to understand this. This is what they were teaching about the God of the Old Testament. Someone said like Martian, huh? Martian? Yeah, Martian, something like that. Yeah. So th this is a Gnostic teaching that, so Christianity, there was a huge, I mean, for centuries, there were massive ideological fights over the interpretation of these scriptures and the attempt to corrupt them. But, but that's a, that's a different, you know, topic again, but it's a really interesting history. It's a fascinating history. Okay. Now, for instance, we've mentioned, this is reliance. Again, we've mentioned this, the superiority of sacred knowledge, right? So this world and what is in it are accursed. This is the Gnostic idea, which is within the Sharia of Islam, right? Now, of course, except for the remembrance of Allah, right? That which Allah loves, someone with sacred knowledge or someone learning it. So sacred knowledge is the only thing that is holy in this world. And, and matter, the world and what is in it, are all cursed. This is the sharia. This is the ijma. But notice, the religious scholar is greater in reward than the fighter in the way of Allah, who fasts the day and prays the night. So remember, the fighter in jihad has 100 degrees in reward, greater than the average Muslim. Well... The religious scholar, the religious elite, is on an even higher level. Amazing. And people don't know the Gnostic origins of Islam. Thank the Lord Jesus for you, brother. All right. So now let me continue. So, okay. So now I can move on to page 45. If anyone comments that they want me to cover anything that I've covered before, let me know. So now yes. I move ahead. So I will do until the section that I, that I skipped. I'll do the portion that I skipped before. And If you have questions for clarification, I'm reading yes. your comments as he's going through. He's trying to finish the slides from last time. He ran out of time. And then he's going to continue with new stuff. So be, be patient with us. This is top-notch information. Praise the Lord for servants like Lloyd for serving us. Okay. So, right. So now... Few people realize, and I've covered this briefly before, but I have it on my channel. There are four levels in Islam, and there are two divisions. Right? I will look at those slides. I will bring them to you again. But you have two divisions. One is called one division. One half of Islam is called the Sharia, which is the laws, the regulations. This is simply what you do. It's like the Pharisees having these rules. Follow these rules. Follow these steps. This is Islam for the lowest level, the masses. Literally, they have a name for for this. They call it Islam for the masses. Then you've got the other side of Islam. The other half is called the Hakika, right? The ultimate reality, the ultimate truth. But then there are also four levels. And the, the top two levels are denied to lay Muslims, even denied to scholars. The second level, remember, Islam does not have priests. It has lawyers. It doesn't have ethics or morals. It has laws, right? It doesn't have right and wrong as an ethical or moral um, divide. It actually has legal and illegal. And Within Islamic law, anything that is illegal can be made legal. There is literally nothing sacrosanct because through loopholes in the law, what they they use what is called hiyal. Uh, I'll actually type that word for you. I'll actually do that. As you, as you do that, I love what you just said. That was brilliant. Did you guys hear it? Islam has lawyers. It doesn't have ethics. It has laws. The way you articulate it, phenomenal. Brilliant, brother. I have yet to hear it articulate the way you did. Glory to Jesus Christ for the wisdom he's given you. Lawyers, not priests, not moral ethics, laws, and there are loopholes where something legal can become illegal, like halal haram. You are a genius, sir. Thank you. Coming wow. from you, Sam, that's high praise. Thank you. No, no, it's amazing stuff. I mean it. That's a phenomenal the way you articulate it. It's beautiful. Thank you. Glory so it is not about right and wrong. It's about legal and illegal and through loopholes in the law, you can make anything, literally anything, legal. Right? Yeah. Okay, cool. so let's look at these levels. Let's have a quick look at these levels. This is from the Encyclopedia of Islam. So we have the Ibarra, the very lowest level in Islam. Notice it says here, in mysticism, oh my gosh, are we getting back into the occult here? Yeah. Okay. In mysticism, the literal language, which is, this is a typo, it means suitable. 
which is suitable for exoteric topics. Exoteric meaning intended for or suitable for communication to the general public. In contrast to the coded language of the ishara, the coded language, the secret mm -hmm. coded language. Your thoughts, Sam, you're nodding your head there. No, because notice again, here you see, this is an authentic source using mysticism, coded, again, coded. This is information that only the elite know, i.e. those who have gnosis. Are you guys seeing it? It's in their own sources. Here's the language. Mysticism, mystical, coded. Yes. All right. Now, the next level is the ishara, which means gesture, sign, indication. These are subtleties, right? And it acquired the technical meaning of allusion. Allusion means to refer to, implied, an indirect reference. It comes from the Latin ad ludere, which means to play with words. Uh, uh, I like that one. <laughs> Your thoughts, Sam, before I go on? That was phenomenal. I didn't even know it's a Latin root and it means to play with words. Exactly what Muslims do in the Quran does and Mama does. It plays with words. To mess with your mind, to you know, I come from I come from a I come from the wrong side of the tracks originally. <laughs> we have different terms to describe that. Okay, yeah. so in mysticism, in mystic mysticism, what do we talk? What do we? What is this? Islam? There's no magic in Islam. It's it's the religion of peace. It's just yeah. it's just what you see is what you. What is this? That's right. Okay, nothing fine, to do with Islam. Nothing to do. Nothing Islam. to do with. Remember those words. Islam has nothing to do with Islam. Remember that. <laughs> in mysticism, it is the esoteric, esoteric, back to magic, language of the inexpressible mystical experience. Symbolic expression, a silent gesture or sign. Just like in masonry. Silent my, sign. oh my. We, where are we going with this, Sam? Yeah, yeah, just like in The masonry. next level is called the Latifa, the plural Lataif. In, in mysticism, oh my, we're back to mysticism. The subtle organ, a theory of levels developed from the time of blah, 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 and the mystics of his school, from mystics. Uh -huh, so, the, so now these levels, so basically your regular imam is at this ishara level, supposedly. Your lay Muslim is at this bottom level here, right? The lataif. Now, I'm going to go off track here, so, so please don't. I looked at this material a long time ago. I haven't yet completed my work on it. At some point, I will talk about this, but, but let me throw this out there because it might just be interesting history, right? Lataif is Latifa, as you see, right? And um, so Latifa also is also known as the linked to the term Leilat, mm. right? The Leilat, okay? So Latifa, Leilat. Now, of course, hold on. Uh, what did I, where did I go now? So we have Latifa. So, okay. You know that in Greek, you have wisdom is the Sophia, but this also has the connotation of the Gnostic wisdom, the secret knowledge. Now, the equivalent within, within the Islamic story, the equivalent is what they call the Leilat. Right? So you've got this Leilat, which is linked to this Latifa, the secret knowledge. In mysticism, it's, you know, the, the blah, 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 the Sophia, the Leilat. Yeah. Right? Well, yeah. Leilat... Let me see. Well, what do you think that that translates to within the within the Hebrew? Who does see, that link uh, us to? When you say Leilat, I'm thinking Islamically late Leilat al Qadr. That's what my mind went to, but I don't know. So you're now making connection with Lilith, Isaiah 34, 14. Is Lilith? Oh. Now Lilith was obviously according to Jewish legend, Jewish myth, and so on, the first wife of Adam, except yeah. she turned evil. She wouldn't have, she wouldn't bow to, she wouldn't, she would not submit herself to her husband. So she turns evil. She turns into a demon. She eats, literally eats babies. She yeah. runs out of the Garden of Eden. God sends two, she's killing babies all over the place. God sends two angels to bring her back. She refuses to come back. But anyway, there's a long bargain made with her. And she is banished to the high places, the dry places and the caves. So she's banished to the deserts and the caves. Yeah. You want to make that connection for me, Sam? Deserts and caves, guys. Think about what he said. Guys, let this sink in. Leilat corresponds to Lilith in Jewish tradition. And the word even Lilith is found in Isaiah 34, 14. Did you catch it? Lilith is basically, and many Luciferians, they consider it the bride of Lucifer, correct? 
Now, so, yeah, go on. Now, I was going to say, did you see? Desert cave. Muhammad, desert Arab, sees a spirit in the cave. Desert cave. So she is banished to deserts and caves. Muhammad, a desert Arab, who sees a spirit in the cave. So, now, Muhammad was supposed to know, like, I mean, again, like, I'm, I'm not saying this is definitive. But I'm just putting this out, right? Just putting out some ideas, connecting a few dots, just putting out some ideas here. So, Remember, Muhammad is supposed to, some people feel that he was an epileptic because whenever, we know from the sources as well, whenever he had a revelation, which was always on a Monday, right? Always on a Monday, he yes. would have these, these episodes and he would go berserk. He'd be jerking and grinding. Well, she was also a succubus. Do you, do you wanna do you wanna use small words and crayon to explain that? Yes. You guys, do you know in demonology you have the incubus and succubus? Succubus would be that demon that comes and pretty much has sex with you, rapes you pretty much, physically rapes you, uh, you know, has sex with you. So Lilith is a succubus. So she's a demon who comes and pretty much will molest you. Yeah. So, so anywho, so maybe that's why Momo decides he's a sex god. So I'm just, just throwing that out there. Just, just throwing that out there. But the, this connection to the Layla, to Latifa. So just keep that in mind. Okay, the okay. final level, right? The final level is the Hakika or the Hakaik. Daniel Hakikachu. Sorry, yeah. Daniel Pikachu. Mm -hmm. So the reality, <laughs> the essence, the truth, okay? It's the basic meaning of a word and it's distinguished from blah, blah. So in philosophy, it has meanings, the ontological meaning, nature or essential reality. Muhammad is the Hakika. He is the foundation of reality. Muhammad is the substrate of reality. The logical meaning is the truth which the exact conception of the thing establishes in the intelligence. It is the ultimate reality, right? And as a scholar, once you get into the connection with this, you know, once you get into these post-rational states, you, 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 you become one with the essence of Muhammad and you understand the exact truth of things, right? In mysticism, it is the profound reality to which only experience of communion with Allah opens the way. And then they speak of here the al-Hakika al-Muhammadiyya, the universal rational principle through which the divine knowledge is transmitted to all prophets and saints, also called the Ruh Muhammad, the spirit wow. of Muhammad, or the Holy Spirit, if you will. What blasphemy. Hmm. Blasphemy. This yeah, is the got... Holy Spirit. Muhammad is the Holy Spirit. Do you understand? You I guys, mentioned this before. You guys catching? I don't mean to cut you off. You see how you have in New Testament the Spirit of God, who is the Spirit of Christ, and you have to have the Spirit of Christ in you, and if the Spirit of Christ is in you, Christ is in you, and you're united to Christ. Here, Islam has taken that and now speaks of the spirit of Muhammad because Muhammad has replaced Christ. And the Holy Spirit that works with Christ is now associated with Muhammad. Are you guys catching this? Pay attention to what he's showing you and see how Satan has perverted the truth of the gospel and used Muhammad, his son, to replace Jesus. Yeah. So this is, this is where they go with this. I mean, so again, this is not me doing like a complete unpacking of it, but understand this is evidence and this leads somewhere. So if you start unpacking this, you'll start to see very quickly where it goes. Okay, so let's continue. Mysticism, definition, a mystical union, right? Or direct communion with ultimate reality reported by mystics. Okay, who is the ultimate reality you're connecting to? The belief that direct knowledge of God, spiritual truth, or ultimate reality can be attained through subjective experience. Subjectivity, non-rational. Vague speculation, a belief without sound basis. And this is the foundation of their beliefs. And we're going to talk more about this. So that's what this mysticism is. And this is entirely rife throughout Islam. This idea of this mysticism is rife in Islam. It is, it is so common. It's crazy how common it is. We've mentioned ilm al-Hruf, al the Ahruf, right? Onomatomancy, yeah. a magical practice based on the occult properties of the letters of the alphabet and of the divine and angelic names which they form. So once you know the secret name of Allah, once you know the secret names of the angels, you can make them do things, right? Yeah. We have discussed this, the Samia, someone mentioned here, but this is hypnosis. This is conversational hypnosis, all right? This is how they, they, they literally take control of your mind, right? To indoctrinate, to change, to make, you, to make you do things. Okay, we've mentioned that the Quran is divided into fire, water, air, and so on. Let us please watch the last episode for more information. I now, know, Yep. I'm going to cut you off. Do you know that word, Samia, if you see the Greek word? Did you know that's a term also used in the Gospel of John for the signs and miracles of Jesus? All right. No, I did not know. 
Yes, and the word when J John speaks of the signs that Jesus did, and it's not Gnostic, obviously. I'm just saying because mm -hmm. it's a Greek term. You have it right there. You put Simeon, and then in the parentheses, you give us a, a Greek. That word Simeon is the word used throughout the Gospel of John to refer to the signs that Jesus did to unveil the true nature of God to the masses, not just to a select group. Isn't it interesting? The very word that John uses in the Gospel of John is now perverted by the Gnostics to point you to... This is the Muslims. Yes, and so, but because it's a Gnostic influence on Islam. Yes, yes, yeah. Just wanted yeah. to let you know, when I saw that word, I go, oh, wait, that's in the Gospel of John. Okay, very interesting. So I don't, so yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, so that's, it's always good to work with people because, I mean, I don't know everything, so people catch things that I miss. Okay, so now we're going to go briefly to hermetism or hermeticism. We're going to have a look at a guy called Hermes Trismegistus, also known as God Mercury. Right, so we're going to look at Hermes or Hermes as he was, as he was brought into Islam. Hermes, right? Let's look at the word haram. The word haram. Now I've discussed this in my previous on my channel and others on a series I called Moonotheism, where I go through in depth the pagan roots of Islam and how Allah literally does come from the moon god of Babylon, right? So, but that's that's a long story for another day. So let's look at the word haram. Used in the popular dialect of Egypt and Ikram, also used, also taken into the Islamic um, vocabulary. Okay, a word of doubtful origin, but it equals pyramid. The haram was originally a pyramid. Now, the Sufis claim to be the inheritors of the mystery religion of Egypt. The Sufis claim to have inherited the first religion, the earliest religion, the original, the inheritors of the original religion of Egypt, which is the one true religion. Okay, so, right, so let's have a look. So haram is pyramid. So the haram, now, that's interesting, that it's got a connection to Egypt. They speak here of <clears throat> legends from the sphere of Coptic Gnostic ideas that have become associated with these buildings. And the two great pyramids there become the tombs of the prophets, the prophets, Hermes, mm -hmm. and Agathodemon. Okay, both link, this one need link to the Gnostics, Agathodemon, and Hermes Trismegistus. So let's have a look at Hermes. Okay, fine, fine. Hermes, Hermes Trismegistus, that strange god incarnate, the Hellenistic name of the Egyptian god Thoth. He's the author of philosophical and magical works and scientific works, but they don't mean science the way we mean it. Hermes Trismegistus passed in his capacities into Islam. <laughs> Islam transformed the god into one of the heroes of olden times, who according to his name Trismegistus is the Mut'allah bil Hikamah. The Hikama is the knowledge and wisdom of Hermes Trismegistus, who, as we know, one is a fictional character, and two is the, the basically the, the, the founder of this magic, this magical practice, this pre-Christian magical practice. Your thoughts, Sam? So this source is confirming this Egyptian, <clears throat> pagan, mystical... <clears throat> deity figure. somehow yeah. found its way in islam so islam now took this figure and islamicized this character so they him made him into idris ah so idris is hermes idris is hermes is hermes trismegistus is an egyptian <laughs> god a pagan god oh my goodness wow and this source is confirming this it's and this is not yeah, a no, this is not but the weird thing is, Sam, that scholars know this stuff. This stuff is not a secret. Now, look, I'm not saying it's easy to find, right? But the scholars know this, but they won't talk about it. It's stuck in these verticals, in these silos. They don't want to connect the dots. And I think it's deliberate because maybe they don't want to get stabbed one fine Tuesday. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, they don't want to get killed. So just so people know, you're not quoting some source that's anti-islamic hates muhammad and it's uh, laughable these are reliable authentic credible scholarly this is sources. the forty thousand dollar encyclopedia of islam yes and even though the scholars know this they don't share this to the public so they know it among themselves so you got to find it otherwise they won't share it with the masses huh so you see so basically he is idris right he yes. lived in Egypt before the flood, and he built the pyramids. See the haram, their name being connected. So the haram is the pyramids. Wow. Okay, so they speak of here. Okay, so we've got this. Now, now have a look here. The book containing philosophical and ethical sayings of Hermes are much more numerous 
to the collections of Ibn al-Kifti and al-Shakhrastani. Shakhrastani is a highly regarded scholar in Islam. I mean, these are just two names here. I just want to mention this guy's philosophy, his magic, his occultism, his esoteric knowledge, all of this stuff. Remember, Madame Blavatsky? Would you say that yeah. Madame Blavatsky was a Muslim? Well, this guy is the source of Madame Blavatsky's knowledge. Tell, tell them who Madame Blavatsky is so they can see the connection again. And I mean, she, she, she claimed, look, she's linked with the Rosicrucians and so on. There's lots of stories. <laughs> yeah, but you see, the, and she is a mystic and a cultist, right? And she, she's teaching sacred knowledge of the ancients from before the time of Jesus, the real secret knowledge. And she is very much linked to her mistress, Magistus, and his sacred knowledge. And now the Muslims claim that Idris, he, Idris is the second prophet mentioned in the Quran, the second he is highly important in the Quran. Are you guys seeing the connection? How it comes from Egypt through Islam to even modern occultists like Madame Blavatsky. It all comes through Islam as the channel. Islam is the channel that's reviving these ancient occult practices that are rooted from the pit of hell. Islam is the channel and the vehicle. Yeah, and Jim Hellenic, which is fantastic comment. Thank you. You forgot to add the Babylonian moon god religion. Yeah, he's learning. He's going to learn. But that was good. I mean, seven out of eight is not bad, right? <laughs> <laughs> so let me continue. They speak here of a comparison with Greek anthologies is badly needed. So in other words, this whole Islamic view of this Idris, this Hermes, right, is badly needed because they stole it from the Greeks. Right, that this whole story of, of Hermes is a complete joke. I mean, one day I'll go into it at length. I have the notes, I just need to compile everything. But basically, it's just it's just the story's a mess. Okay, it's it's fiction, right? It's bad fiction. But Hermes shows strong monotheistic features similar to, similar to those described by Al Saraksi. So he's another major Islamic scholar. So they, they are talking about the features of God, and so there's a link to Hermes here. Okay, but this is heavily what I'm what I'm just trying to say is that the Theosophy. Yes, Islam caused theosophy, the theosophist. Thank you. She, Madame Blavatsky was a theosophist, right? Now, of course, what I'm saying is that, that if you start to dig, you'll find that this stuff is heavily discussed in Islam by Islamic major Islamic scholars. Now, in the Encyclopedia of Islam, we've discussed Akhruf in the previous episode. So Hermes Trismegistus is a mythical Egyptian sage who was reputed to live as a contemporary of Moses. The hermetic corpus laid out procedures that allowed a magician to compel angels and other spirits to carry out his orders. Didn't we just speak of that with the Akharuf? Right? Yes. We spoke with that at length in the previous show. And Hermeticism exactly. is an ancient occult tradition encompassing alchemy, astrology, and theosophy. And we find all three in Islam. My goodness. So now let's let's continue. A little last section on this guy. So according to Ibn Kamal Pasha, Istanbul, 1534, blah blah blah. These sciences, these Muslim sciences, remember everything in Islam is a science, okay, were practiced by the greatest spirits of humanity. Here we've got a Muslim telling us these are great spirits of humanity, such as Hermes, who is Idris. They mentioned Plato, Pythagoras, Thales, and Archimedes. They've even been attributed to Aristotle, two works, one on Akharuf. Hmm. So now, and the other on arithmomancy, gematria, basically number magic. So now you've got Akhruf, right, the science, on Aristotle. So people, remember I mentioned that people have no idea how Neoplatonism and Aristotle, through the lens of neo, bad Neoplatonists, have made its way into Islam. They've copied all of this Greek magic, this Greek esoteric magic. All of that stuff is in Islam, just not discussed. My goodness, this is shocking stuff. Okay, so Idris is an ancient prophet mentioned in the Quran, who Muslims believe was the third prophet of the Seth. Is the second prophet mentioned in the Quran. Islamic tradition has unanimously identified Idris with the biblical Enoch, although many Muslim scholars of the classical and medieval period held that Idris and Hermes Trismegistus were the same person. So basically, take Dul Karnain, who is, you know, is um, you know, um, Alexander the Great. Well, today he's not Alexander the Great because that's embarrassing. Exactly. By the same token, Hermes Trismegistus. Oh no, 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 never! He's Enoch. We worship the same God. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. So, so people, I want them people to understand what you're saying. Today, Muslims are embarrassed to associate these Quranic figures with their pagan counterparts. But if you go to the classical Muslims, it's what he's saying. Pay attention because I'm going to show you another example to confirm what he's saying. 
<clears throat> so these figures, when you read in the medieval Muslim sources, are identified with pagan counterparts. Because in Islam, they're taught, guys, listen to this, and I don't mean to interrupt, I want to speak, but I want you to catch this point. In Islam, they're taught that there is evidence that all these religions originally had prophets from Allah, but their followers took their teachings and quote-unquote paganized them. So that you have Alexander the Great as Dul Qurnayn, who's a Muslim, but later tradition pretty much twisted, distorted the picture of Alexander the Great, so he ends up becoming a pagan. Similarly, today, to hear what he's saying, you have Hamza Yusuf. Don't take my word for it. Go on YouTube, because I, I listen to him. He believes that the figure El Khidr, the green one, the one who accompanied Moses, is actually the Buddha, because Muslims think that the Buddha may have been a prophet, but his teachings were corrupted. So you see what Muslims are doing? They're taking these pagan figures and Islamicizing them. That's what he's showing you. So Idris is originally Hermes, who's nothing more than an Egyptian pagan deity, but Islamicized and turned into a Muslim prophet. Thank you, brother. Well, thanks, yeah. Look, he might have been, been a priest, but he got elevated or whatever the story is. I mean, he's like, whatever. I mean, so priest, deity, whatever. But he's critically important. Today, he's worshipped as, you know, blah, blah, blah. So moving on. He becomes Mercury eventually, right? The God, right? Or the messenger of the God or whatever. Okay, so now, in the first apocalypse of James, some Gnostic texts say that Jesus taught that the world was a prison created by an evil God. The world is guarded by evil archons requiring a secret password to enter the heavens. James has secret passwords to ascend to the highest heaven out of 72 heavens. 72 heavens sounds familiar. I know of religion that gives you 72 heavenly pleasures or something, but something like that. The whores of paradise. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, you know what? While we're here, hold on, hold on. That's actually very interesting. Now that you, now that you've mentioned this. Um. Oh, uh, you know what? Um. Now that now that you're here, uh, now that you've mentioned that, you just made me think of something. Something about them whores of heaven just triggers. No, no, you made me, th yeah, so now I have to, um, sometimes the search is a tad slow, but I know where I'm going, but I have to get past. Um, hmm. So I'm just going to briefly bring up something from the Encyclopedia of Islam, just so it's just there's something that, that, that occurred to me as we were speaking. The term Huda, we're going to have a look here at Okay, I want to mention the term hurra, okay? In Bedouin society, that's Muslim society, is a term, the term hurra is a term for the young girl who must be a virgin, she must be white, and must be given by the family of a murderer to a member of the injured family as compensation. In latter, in turn, the latter, the family of the injured, you know, forgoes his right of vengeance. Okay, that's a hurra. So in other words, now the question is, okay, so your family has harmed another Muslim family, right? So now you want compensation. So what they say, tell you what, you can give us some money or you can give us a white girl. Oh, wow. So okay. ask yourself where they were getting the white girls from. Yeah. Are you, are, you, are, you, are you saying these are white girls from those taken captive from the byzantines when muhammad said you'll find these from europe. girls and from europe of course ah, okay so now ah, let's go here to uh, so hold on so now i want to so now let's go to huris which is linked okay so so the term hawra right hur plural hur meaning white okay ah. now genuinely applied to the very large eyes but don't get fooled because the, the Encyclopedia of Islam will try and fool you sometimes. It tries to give you a secondary or tertiary meaning and makes it primary. But the primary meanings it buries down at the bottom. Whites. And to the whiteness of his skin. Okay? In eschatology, that's the end times um, theology, the plural of hur or huris is used in the Quran for the virgins of paradise promised to the believers. But notice what they mean is these women are white women. So I just wanted to mention you spoke of huris that just... Because the important thing is that they are white women. 
because Huri really means white woman. Mm. Because that's why they love blondies because it reminds them of the whores of paradise. I see. Right. So he assigned to each. So in the Quran forty one twelve, he assigned to each heaven its duty and command, and we adorned the lower heaven with lights and provided it with a god, just like the Gnostics have a god at each level of heaven. Right. Yeah. So just something out of to bear in mind. Now Paul warns Timothy about Gnosticism when he says, "Oh Timothy." God, what is committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called gnosis by professing it. Some have strayed concerning the faith. This is an entirely war entire chapter warning about the, the, the false science, because it's also interpreted as the oppositions of science, falsely so-called knowledge and science. And Islam claims that everything is a science. Right. Yeah. So this is something that the Bible warns about. Now, in fact, the general tendency was to be observed among practitioners of the Islamic religious sciences <clears throat> to consider as knowledge only that inherited from the Prophet Muhammad. Okay? So, for instance, they speak here for Ibn Taymiyyah, the science par excellence is that which derives from the Prophet. So, only Muhammad gave true science. All the rest is either useless or does not deserve to be called science. So, Western science doesn't deserve to be called science because it didn't come from Muhammad. Numerous prophetic traditions on the study of science in Islam concern only religious knowledge. This is how Muslims view the word science. Hmm. So it's all anchored in Muhammad. He is the gateway to true Gnosis. He is it. He's the Ruh, the spirit. So he's the one that is the true Gnostic. The knowledge that he gave, yeah. He's the perfect man. Remember, he's the he's the Qutb, the Insan al Kamal, right? So uh, we've mentioned this about the ulama and the ghayb. We've talked about this before, right? So for instance, Quran 344, this is a part of the news of the ghayb, the unseen, the news of the past nations of which you have no knowledge. So the Quran contains at least 15 references to the ghayb, what is hidden, what is inaccessible to the senses and to reason, what is beyond reason, what is in the irrational mystery, right? In mysticism, the reality of the world beyond reason only gnosis experiences, and so you have to know the gnosis. Reba, occultation, mysticism, right? So understand, this is the Quran is talking about a mystical, magical concept. It's, it's occult magic. And this is what, in when we looked at the Muslim Brotherhood and we looked at the, um, the, the charter of Hamas, that's what they were referring to. Okay, we've mentioned that the that the Sufis call themselves the perfect Illuminati. Right? Forget the word salad around it, but the Sufis believe that they are the perfect Illuminati. And we've mentioned this before, so I'll, I'll go through this a little more depth now. So, there are two divisions in Islam. On the left, you've got the Sharia, or the law, the regulations. The Sharia means to obey Allah, to follow the rules. It is the Zahir, it is the outer, the exoteric, the public, right? the, the outer show. It is the outer meaning, the outer practice. It's the first level of meaning, the plain level of meaning. Okay, Then you've got the hakika, the knowledge. It's the knowing Allah. But this is, this is restricted to the scholars only. It is known as the batan, the inner, the esoteric. It is the inner, direct, personal, but very subjective knowledge. It is experience. It is the gnosis of Allah. Then you have the four levels. Those are your two divisions. Then you have the ibara, the literal, the zahir which the scholars quite literally call Islam for the masses. Then you have the ishara, implied allusion, sign, gesture, like the Freemasons, all of their yep. secret signs, secret symbols. Lata'if, nuances, subtleties in the text, and then the haqqa'iq, reality, truth, the divine essence. And this is the level of the Mohammedan reality. The Ruh Muhammad, the spirit of Muhammad, or the Holy Spirit, transmits divine knowledge to the prophets and the Sufi saints. So as I'm learning, paying attention, I'm seeing people are distracting others because they're having a conversation apart from this topic. Brethren, sure. I want to warn you guys again. I'm trying to focus and learn from this man. He's giving you stuff. And Ricky and L. Pipe decide to have their own conversation about white-skinned women, that they're Middle Eastern women who are white, and losing the main focus of the content. And so not only are you robbing yourself, you're distracting us and causing us to stumble because this is stuff you're not going to learn in seminary, 
university and definitely you're not going to learn from Muslims because you're not one of the elite Muslims. You're a kafir and you're now disrespecting Lloyd and robbing him of his time by going off on tangents. I'm going to start blocking people. Focus on the material. Sorry, brother, for the distraction. Okay. Yeah. So, sorry. I, but yeah, maybe I should also not sort of go off topic here and there. But oh, any comments from this material here on this page? Not your fault because they know the rules. I tell them do not engage each other. Focus on the speaker. Now, any comments on what he just said so he can clarify, so he can move on? Because this is tons of material that's going to take a lot of sessions for us to unpack. And he's being gracious to come here to do it. And may the Lord increase his numbers and provide for him. And I hope I can facilitate. Do you have do any, you have any knowledge or thoughts on this slide on the division and levels, Sam? Yes. Do you understand what he just said? There are two levels of Islam, basically. The outer meaning for the lay people like us if we're Muslims. Then you have the inner, true, hidden meaning only available to the scholars, the upper echelon. That's Gnosticism. Only the elite know the true inner meaning of Islam, whereas everyone else is given the external <clears throat> Islam, which is not really true Islam. So far, yeah, no. The wolf says, do Muslims know about these divisions? Probably <laughs> yes and no. Yes, maybe not explicitly. Maybe they can't articulate it, but they remember they always say to you, have you consulted a scholar? That's right. Well, I think scholar. they should now start consulting me. <laughs> yeah. 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 See, here we got this guy, Ricky. See, see, brother. This Ricky, he's upset because I don't know if you know him. His mother was a Shia. And so in Islam, in Iran, they still do muta. So he's still upset and angry. He's attacking us because his mother did, decided to do muta. And so Ricky doesn't know which she fathered him. So he's upset, brother. So what we do to people who are weak and pathetic and losers, we don't engage them. We send them back to their vomit and stuff them with their vomit like the Shia did. So go ahead, brother. Yeah, look, man. I Look, on my channel, I tell people I don't have time for nonsense. Look, my, my job in the past was not to – my job had consequences. If I was wrong, people died. Okay, there'd be blood on the floor. There'd exactly. be there'd, there'd be things would be blown apart. So I didn't come from a speculative background. I came from hard, concrete decisions that had to be made. So so really, I, I think people have not had honest, genuine experience of just where this information goes, exactly. of how dangerous this information is, and what people will do for it. So so yeah, I mean, it's just um, I come at Islam because I think it is dangerous. It is evil and i've seen it firsthand right my job is to make sure that 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 the people who believe this nonsense didn't cause international incidents so yes. see so yeah, i have a very different perspective and I, I think people need to understand that islam these people are deadly serious and they are deadly and they will kill you behead you without mercy without yeah. mercy so, blow themselves up but thank also, god I, i'm not keen on people spreading their propaganda i will ban them on my channel i have very little patience i have extremely little patience you're a man after my heart lloyd that's why i love you sir i'm the same way so go ahead brother you're yeah. blowing people's okay. mind away for listening you. you're blown away so ixan faith gnostic so the gnostic perfection of faith right the perfection of faith we discussed this last week so remember for the lowest level of muslim is to worship in a way that fulfills the obligations in other words follow the rules right go to mosque Pray five times a day. What all that nonsense, right? Go to mosque on Fridays, you know. Have your bacon, but don't tell anybody. All that kind of stuff, right? Get right, drunk, so. but, but don't let your mother find out. All that kind of stuff. Hide where to hide your wine. Follow those rules in Islam, you know. You know, brush your teeth before after you drank beer. All of those rules. Follow those rules in Islam, and you'll be <laughs> fine. <Yeah>. But um, <clears throat> I, I should warn you, Sam. I think you probably know, but but. One of my major superpowers is sarcasm. Although I swear I can only use it for good. <laughs> no, no, you never. You are just one of those sophisticated, scholarly Western types. Well, the overwhelming preponderance of the evidence. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's 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 what uh, I. What did you just say? So anyhow, anyhow. So, but understand they mention here that this now for the scholars they must do this while immersed in the sea of Gnostic inspiration. Right, and they mentioned here that the perfection of faith is required. Okay, the perfect. So the perfection required for the validity of worship is only the first. That's the lowest level is required for the lay Muslims, but for the elect, it is the rest. To know the gnosis. 
So there's a separation. There's a very strong separation in Islam. We covered this last week. Okay, We've already discussed this. I'm not going to belabor it again. And we've mentioned this now. There's a harsh dualism between the world of matter and spirit. So in Islam's view, that is why they claim that fitna is worse than murder. Wow. This is why. Because the world and what is in it is accursed. But spiritual matters are more important. This is why fitna literally translates as effectively temptation. Temptation away from Islam. Whatever mm. tempts you away from Islam must be punished with death. And tempting someone from the deen is worse than murdering the person who would yeah. tempt you. So. Yep. That's beautiful. You even quoted the chronic verse I was thinking about. See? Yep, exactly. Okay, so we've covered this. So let me go. So esoteric, okay. The word esoteric is designed for or understood by the initiated alone, by the specially initiated. That's not you, by the way, if you're wondering. Yeah. Requiring or exhibiting knowledge that is restricted to a small group. You're not in that group. Just so, by the way, yeah. limited to a small circle. Notice how often the word esoteric actually came up within these Islamic discussions on the yes. encyclopedias and others. See? Yes. So, Kushairi, now the scholar who, who, the scholar who became the authority on this topic is Kushairi. He wrote the Lataif al Isharat, al Tafsir al Quran, is the famous work by al Kushairi. It's a complete commentary. So, there are four levels. Okay. The first is the meaning of the text meant for the mass of believers. Literally called Islam for the masses by the scholars. The second is the ishara, only available to the spiritual elite. It is beyond the obvious verbal meaning. Now, yeah, this is within the, the this is the authority on this topic in Islam, Kushayri. The third, Lataif, is subtle in the text, meant particularly for the saints, the saints of the Sufis, just so by the way. Okay. And then, of course, sorry, what did I just, oh, I pressed the wrong button. I made a wrong mistake there. And then you had the Arqaiq, which he said was only comprehensible to the prophets. And of course, the senior scholars are the inheritors of the prophets. They are the, they are the descendants of the prophets, and they are the ones who are continuing the work of the prophets. Therefore, yes. the senior ulama are the prophets today, and they have this knowledge. Just to confirm, Lloyd, what you're saying, guys, I want you to hear this, man. Please pay attention. This is gold. May God bless him. There's a tradition attributed to Muhammad that says that the scholars are the heirs of the prophets. Yes. You hear what he's saying? In prophets, the highest level, second level scholars, heirs of the prophets. So you that's why Muslim come saying go to a scholar, because they are the heirs of the prophets. Yes, there you go. correct. And that's in the Sharia. They state that explicitly. They're the heirs of the prophets. So this text placed thing among the elite of the Sufi mystics and is widely used as a standard of Islamic thought. Fine. We've covered this ad nauseum. So, okay. And notice Ghazali actually said that Sufism, Tasawuf, is personally obligatory for every Muslim. So we'll, we'll not get into that. So the term Khalifa, okay, the perfect man. Khalifa, everyone says the Khalifa, oh, like the Caliph, 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 Caliph. Let's have a quick look at Caliph as a title after the first four Caliphs. Okay, fine and all. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, blah, 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 blah. So, Khalifat Rasulullah, successor of the messenger of God. Okay, successor of Muhammad, blah, blah, blah. In mysticism. What? Back to mysticism, Sam. Yes, there we go. Yeah. So, it may have any of the following meanings, but notice the Qutb, or the perfect man, the Al-Insan Al-Kamal, which is Latin for as insane as a camel, right? Now, we know that Muhammad was the Qutb, the perfect man, right? Yes. Upon whom, think so... Sorry? They didn't hear you say insane as a camel. I got that, brother. Good one. <laughs> yeah. So, so notice that the, the, the Khalifa is the perfect man around whom the spheres of being evolve, upon whom the Mohammedan reality, which is the hidden side of his own reality, where you become God, you see, irradiates. And mystical perfection, you know, you reach a certain stage of mystical perfection. And you are granted permission by your spiritual master to initiate novices and to guide them on the mystical path. And then among the Bektashia, it refers to a rank of spiritual achievement, Khalifa. Now, don't forget, when we spoke of the Baron von Sbottendorf, the guy who founded the Thule Society, which is an Islamic mystical Sufi society, which Hitler joined, and then Hitler made that into the Nazi party. I wonder where he got all those crazy ideas. He was a Bektashi. So the gentleman that influenced Hitler was a Bakhtashi party was from this group, yes. Are you guys, you see that, guys? 
So Nazism comes out of the filth of Islam, which comes out of the filth of Gnosticism. So those who say that, you know, Hitler was a Christian, there you go. He was more of a Muslim than, than he ever was a Christian. Yeah, I mean, we go if we go into the like the other ties. If you go into the Salafi and their connections to the Nazis, holy moly! I mean, seriously, that would shock you with how much how tightly Islam is connected to Nazism. I mean, you would be shocked. The historical evidence. I mean, seriously. And as you guys know, I I throw reams of evidence at people. I don't make things up. I I bring the books, you know. And I don't just bring. I found this written down on a napkin in a, in an old toilet, you know. It's like I'm I'm bringing the very best of scholarship. I mean, for instance, I'm also careful of my sources. I can tell you a, a practical example. I was once driving down the, down the highway. I got pulled over by a cop. And he said, do you know how fast you were going? And I said, I'm going 70. And he says, didn't you see the sign back there that said 50? And I looked at him and I said, I don't believe everything I read. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I like that. Any connection he's saying with Hemelik Himmler? Um, there, there's loads of connections to um, there's okay. loads of connections to the Nazis and the and Muslims. I like that one. Yeah, that some of them converted to Islam. So okay, so basic view of Islam on Christ. They said in boast, "We killed Christ Jesus, the Son of Mary, the Messenger of Allah," but they killed him not. So the whole point of Islam is to deny the crucifixion, the resurrection, right? Which undermines Christianity completely. Okay, so they not they did not crucify him. It was made to appear to them. This is taken entirely from various Gnostic groups we've mentioned before that claim that Jesus was never crucified, right? Yes. Another was made to resemble him, and those who differ there are full of doubts with no certain knowledge, but only conjecture of a surety they killed him not. Nay, Allah raised him up unto himself. Now, a couple of points here. One, why did Allah not raise Muhammad unto himself? Good question. Right? And question. also, when they say that they are full of doubts with no certain knowledge, Muslims will love to repeat the story as it is, but if you go to the original Islamic scholars who wrote about the whole, the arrest of Jesus, the, the whole process of, of what happened up to the ascension, when you read these stories, for every scholar you read, you get a completely different story. Like one of the, one of the, one of the funnier ones is that Jesus was with the disciples in the house and he was surrounded by 4,000 Jews. 4,000 Jews surrounded the house and they couldn't escape. So, so God had to take him out through a hole in the roof and he put his face on the face of another man. And in another one, he runs out of the house and he runs down an alleyway and then Jesus disappears because God takes him away. But then the Jew that chased him and they give his name and all that, his name was Yehuda, which just means Jew. They took, they, God put Jesus's face onto Yehuda. So Yehuda comes out and they capture Yahuda and they crucify him instead. So the Jew that chased you, oh, blah, blah. You just get, the Muslims have no idea. When you go into the history of, of yeah. the story, it's, it's a complete joke. Yeah, 100%. Exactly. Spot on. Okay. So notice that Satan does not require you to worship him to win. He just has to keep you from knowing Christ. Amen. Okay. Exactly. So. Now, notice they speak in the Sharia here. This refers to the extremism of the Jews concerning Jesus in accusing Mary of fornication and the extremism of the Christians in considering him a God. For both excessiveness and remissness are evil and unbelief. See, so we are guilty of kufr because we are extremists for considering Jesus a God. This is in the Sharia. Right? This is the Ijma. This is the, the, um, the consensus of the Muslim scholars. And... I am the truth, okay? They made the mistake of the Christians who saw this in the person of Jesus and said that Jesus was the divinity because, well, Muslims know that Muhammad is the truth. Yeah. See? The mistake of the Christians. Now, this docetic, so the Manichaean, so well, this, this docetic interpretation regarding Jesus' crucifixion was spread by the Manichaeans. Manichaeanism was, was prevalent in Arabia during the 6th century. Others as well. So the prohibition of wine and the fasting rules, Islamic views on Jesus' death might well have been influenced by Manichaeism. So this comes, so the prohibition of wine and the rules of fasting also comes out of the Manichaeans. Manichaeism quotes the Gospel of Thomas 73 times. Wow. They right? love that and the Muslims wow. also, yeah. <clears throat> so now this is from an older text again, <clears throat> on a much older scholarly text. They speak of heterodox Christian doctrine borrowed from Docetism. So 
It cannot be here our task to trace the influences of Docetism on Islam. It is highly probable that this doctrine came to the Muslims through the medium of Manichaeism, which adopted this belief and gave it definite shape. The Jesus of the Manichaeans had no objective reality as a man, a mere apparition, right? And an emissary of the devil who tried to frustrate the activity of Jesus, who as a punishment for his wickedness was fastened to the cross. This idea made its way into Islam, right? Mm. The, the scholarship from, from the 19th century, 18th century already knew this. So it was long known, but World War II was a massive interruption to this whole process. World War I, in fact. And all of the scholarship got gotten. So the credibility of gospel history, just briefly, 1758, there's a lot of old scholarship from the Brits and the Germans that goes back 16, 1700s, 1800s, that has all been forgotten. And scholars are now reinventing the wheel. But if you go back to old texts, you'll find they are, they've already said all the things that we are saying today, what we're discovering today, these guys two, 300 years ago were already writing about. Okay. They speak here of the Manichaeans, the travels of the apostles and so on. So basically they speak of how these groups had borrowed Christian ideas, but that the Christian ideas were sound. I'll, I'll skip this slide. I'm not going to get into it. But let's talk about Manichaeans and the Jahaliya. Manichaeans believe the world had been taken over by an evil demiurge, the king of darkness. The result of his victory for man is that reason was taken away from them and they became like unto a man bitten by a wild dog, the Jahiliya. Mm. You see? For a genesis of, so anyway, so basically, Jahil means ignorance, not yet initiated into the truths of the faith. You are mm. therefore barbaric, anti Islamic, and wicked. It implies apostasy from Islam and punishable by death. This is the definition of Jahil. So you are, the Jahiliya was not a period. The Jahiliya is a state of ignorance. Yeah. If you're not a Muslim, you are. We are uh, you and I are Jahiliya. Yeah, correct. We're in the state of ignorance. So it's the term for the condition of ignorance. Muslims love to tell you it's the time of ignorance. You know, the seventh century, but not today. No, not true. Before the mission of Muhammad, it was paganism. And we are, therefore, we are the worst of beasts because we are like unto a wild man, man bitten by a wild dog. See? Yeah. So this this is where Islam seems to get this idea. Okay. So I'll skip some of this stuff. Now notice I'm going to talk here about. <clears throat> so they talk about Jesus here. He raised the dead, made the blind, he healed lepers, and he molded a bird from clay and breathed into it. It became a living bird. Okay. When the Bani Israel wanted to kill him, Allah saved him as described in the words of the Holy Quran. They did not slay him. And Yehuda, chief of the Jews, met with a band of his people to kill Esau. Allah sent Gabriel to Isa to lead him to a covered alleyway that had a skylight to which he was taken up to the sky. Yahuda in pursuit ordered one of his companions to follow him into the passageway. Allah cast the likeness of Isa upon the man as he entered. And when he came out again after a fruitless search, the Jews attacked and killed him, thinking him to be Jesus and hung him upon a cross. Yeah. Yeah. That's the true history, by the way. That's what you're well, celebrating. I have dozens of these stories. You go, go consult a bunch of scholars, you get a bunch of versions. They all differ. And they say we differ. We tell one story of the crucifixion. Exactly. One. They tell a dozen or more. Number Lloyd, this weekend you're celebrating this event. Someone was made to look like Jesus. He was killed. So that's what you're celebrating this weekend. Yeah, but don't forget, it was Allah that yeah. caused the deception. Yep. So Allah caused everyone to believe it. Yep. So why would Allah cause a deception that caused everyone to be deceived? Because you're not a Gnosis. You're not of the elite Sufi scholars. You don't know the hidden esoteric meaning man you're a jahil come on correct and notice he molded a bird from clay and breathed into it it became a living bird this is taken straight out of the infancy gospel of thomas as well as the um i think it's called the egyptian infancy gospel this is gnostic it's gnostic stories what why is it in Isl islamic stories because this is not orthodox christianity this is gnostic why are these yeah. muslim scholars repeating literally gnostic stories that's yeah question because they were they were reading the gnostics and they thought this was orthodox christianity they did not know the bible this is a direct reference to the infancy gospel of thomas a mystical tale with no biblical support it's also found in the arabic infancy gospel of the savior this story of he molded a clay bird is gnostic the islamic christology is entirely traceable to gnostic stories it is not orthodox in any way and we can prove happily I mean, look, Sam, in four years, I've invited hundreds of Muslims. Every Muslim who comments, I'm like, look, buddy, that's nice. You've got a big mouth. You love to comment. Come on my yeah. channel. Let's let's have a read through the Sharia. Let's let's read through the Sira. Let's look at the miracles of Muhammad. Let's let's look at the, the Gnostic stories and compare with the Muslim stories. And let's, you know, let's just see if you guys have been. Yeah. I haven't had one in like four years. Not a single person has accepted. 
course they can't. Brother, you, your knowledge, it's a gift from God. You would be ha too dangerous for them to debate. So all they're going to do is slander you and try to kill you. But your life is in the hands of Jesus. And may he preserve you and use you for many years. This is solid information that's overwhelming. They can't refute it. They can't. Thank you. So, of course, in the Quran 25.4, the misbelievers say, Naught is this but a lie which he has forged and others have helped him. And they say these are tales of the ancients which he has caused to be written. They are dictated before him morning and evening. There are dozens of Gnostic stories within Islam, like huge numbers of them. Uh, yeah. Few people realize that the hadiths were called, okay, so the hadiths, before the hadiths were written, the Muslims were repeating Jewish stories, okay, Jewish Mishnah. And they yeah. used to be called the Israeliat. And eventually the hadiths were written and the Israeliat were thrown out and forgotten. But they were repeating Jewish stories before the hadiths were, were composed. Okay. So everyone knows that Muhammad was the ear. Everyone knows, you know, he's an ear and he was listening. So I'm, I won't repeat that. Um, in this, this is, I'm not going to play this, but the, the authenticity of the Sirah. So Adnan Rashid claims that Ibn Ishaq is authentic. This is now the, from the gospel of Muhammad. Now, lots of people, I was speaking to Jay Smith some time ago, and, and they thought at the time, many, many people thought that, oh, the, the, the Sirah of Muhammad, the Gospels of Muhammad, you know, the, the biographies, oh, there's just one. I said, no, there's like 50 of them. I've got at least 50 just in English. Yeah. I, I said, I found at least 150 in Arabic. And he's like, what? There's more than one? I'm like, yeah, there's dozens of these things. So, so basically, here he claims that Ibn Ishaq, which is the Sirah of Muhammad, the Gospels of Muhammad, is authentic and reliable. And then when a Christian scholar starts quoting it, he goes, well, you know, actually, you know, well, you know. So, yeah, I mean, it's just, just complete. It's just bogus. Okay. So I want to mention here, there's the, remember we spoke of Hermes, right? The Hermeticism. Yes. Now the gospel of the Egyptians. So look at this here. The holy book of the Egyptian Gnostics is about the great invisible spirit, the father whose name cannot be spoken. Allah, remember the secret name? Yes, right. It came forth from the heights of the perfection. They speak of three powers came forth from him, the father, the mother, and the mm. son. Mm. Now, do you know of a, of a holy book that claims that the – do you know, Sam, you know where I'm going with it? Sam, help of me course. out here. You're, you're telling me chapter 5, verse 73, 75, and chapter 5, verse 116 of the Quran, where the people, whoever they are, claim that Allah is the third of three, and the other two is Jesus and his mother, father, mother, and son. Yeah. And we were speaking about the, the Egyptian connection through hermitism into Islam. The Gnostic Trinity incorporates the Egyptian mysteries. Oh my, the mother, the Holy Spirit, is the second person of the Trinity. <laughs> I wonder if that is a link. Who knows? It just could be sheer coincidence. Yeah. So, yeah. And also, the Holy Spirit, she might also be identified with the Egyptian Ka, the connecting and transmitting spirit, the messenger. So that's the link to Jibril, or the Ruh Muhammadi. So potentially, right? So I'll just mention that as, as something. So just briefly, a Gnostic Mary in the Quran. So Mary receives miraculous food in Cain, Surahs 337 and 344. She gets miraculous food. So Muhammad plagiarized and altered biblical tales of Noah, Abraham, Lot, Moses, Mary, and Jesus. Right? There's a well-known Gnostic infancy gospel that invented fictions about Mary. We'll discuss that in another time. But in the Quran 337, her Lord accepted her graciously and she grew up with excellence. She was given into the care of Zechariah and Whenever he came to her chamber, he found her provided with food. And he asked, where's this come from? And she said, from Allah, who gives food in abundance to whomsoever he will. Right? So the Quran plagiarizes this myth from the Proto-Evangelium of James, or the Gospel of James. It should be noted that the word James is not in the original Greek. It's actually Yaakov, or Jacob. Yeah. But if you go back to a man called the Morning Star of the Reformation, the Morning oh. Star is one of the names of a guy called Satan. <clears throat> Right, yeah. and there's a man called. Um, uh, oh, gosh, I've just forgotten his name. He, yeah, I'm, yeah, uh, I'm trying to figure out my name. I'll get uh, it. Right Wycliffe, Wycliffe. If yeah, not right. Wycliffe, it's the other dude, but it's probably Wycliffe. Okay, so uh, from a Protestant point of view, the claim is made. He was the first one to translate the Bible into English. You know, there was about there was a bunch of translations into English. John D. Wycliffe. Point. He's called the Morning Star of the Reformation. Yeah. John. Wycliffe. So he was called the Morning Star of the Reformation, which is one of the names of Satan by a guy that was formerly a priest that left and became an atheist or some kind of heretic. So a guy that turned on the church, condemned the church, named Wycliffe the Morning Star of the Reformation, which is very weird. Wycliffe's Bible was full of corruption. 
Okay. Wycliffe's Bible was full of corruption. Yes. Well, let me ask you a question because I'm not too familiar. He ended up becoming an atheist? No. The guy who called Wycliffe oh. the Morning Star was a oh. guy who had, had apparently been with the church and then turned on the church, condemned I the church. See. But for some reason, this guy who turned against the church and became either some sort of heretic, he called Wycliffe the Morning Star. Wow. And he gave an appellation of Satan to wow. Wycliffe. So let, let me have this point so we can catch a catch. You guys, you saw it? The one who called John Wycliffe the morning star of the Reformation was himself a heretic who abandoned the church, became an atheist, and started opposing Jesus Christ. So an atheist gave John Wycliffe the name the morning star of the Reformation. Now, where do you think that atheist got it from? Obviously, Isaiah 14, 12, where it refers to Lucifer as the morning star. Wow. Yeah, so 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 because we'd have to go into Tyndale and Wycliffe. I mean, we would have to go into Tyndale and Wycliffe, but I mean that's a story for another day. But but it's very interesting how the story. I mean, once you go into it, it's just really fascinating. The story that you're told and the history are two very different things. But anyway, moving on. So what you've got is this Proto Evangelium of James. Proto Evangelium means the first gospel of James, right? But also Wycliffe. Where I was going with this, Wycliffe basically. The whole point of these, the whole point of very, very many supposed Christians back in the day was to try to separate Christianity from Judaism in any way possible, to strip it of its Jewish influences. Therefore, Jesus was never a Jew. The Jews were never Jews. None of the, none of the apostles of Jesus were Jews. They were all Christians and the Jews are just evil, right? This is still common in a lot of, I've seen a lot of Protestants talk about this today. Right, and so they called it James. There's no reason why, but they called him James, and it was Jacob or Jacob. So the whole idea of calling it the Gospel of James is a way to change. It's like it's like calling it's like Sam. I suddenly call you, I call you. Your name is Sam, but I suddenly change your name to I don't know Michael, for no reason because it's like giving you a fake name to to change your identity. I see. That's why. Okay. So they wanted to disassociate them from their Jewish roots. Correct. Correct. They, they, that's exactly what they wanted to do. And in fact, so if you look at the original Hebrew names, I mean, many of them, it's like, it's like, huh, you'd never recognize them. You know, when you look at these names, there's no reason for, for choosing those names. Okay, so anyway, in the, it's a second century infancy gospel telling of the miraculous conception of the Virgin Mary, her upbringing, marriage to Joseph, the journey to Bethlehem and the birth of Jesus and events immediately following. So that's a very interesting story. I mean, an incredibly interesting story as well when you look at it, Islam. But um, <clears throat> um, yeah, so... It is the earliest surviving assertion of the perpetual version of Mary, but that's not important. So, um, yeah. yeah. So, in this story, okay, Mary's mother made a sanctuary in Mary's bedchamber, and Mary was in the temple, nurtured like a dove, and she received food from the hand of an angel. So, the Muslims just copied this story, basically. They just copied this story, and it's in the Quran, and there you go. Jesus speaks as a baby in the cradle. Jesus speaks while still an infant in Surahs 19, 29, and 346. How shall we talk with him who is but an infant in the cradle? And Jesus said, I'm a servant of Allah. He has given me the book. Because God is a librarian and Jesus had a library card. <laughs> and he has made me a prophet and he has made me blessed wherever I may be. Okay. So Muhammad co-ops and he turns Jesus into a Muslim who makes salat and pays zakat. Right. And Muhammad fabricated revelations and his fictions are derived from the Gnostic Arabic infancy gospel of the Savior. So this is not orthodox. Again, he's borrowing a Gnostic text to give Jesus this story. Right? Yeah. So in the original, it goes that Jesus spoke when he was in the cradle and said to Mary's mother, I am Jesus, the son of God, the word which thou hast borne, according That's as the original. angel Gabriel gave thee good news. Just so people understand, the original, the infant Jesus says he is the son of God, the word which God uh, conveyed to Mary. That's what the original said, right? Yeah, this is it. Yeah, yeah. But what did Islam do with it? Go ahead. I just want people to say that the original source, Jesus as an infant says he's God's son and the word conveyed to Mary. Muhammad yeah. takes it and changes it. So go ahead. Yeah. He has enjoined upon me to offer salat and give zakat. He has made me a prophet and he has made me blessed wherever I may be. I'm a servant of Allah. He has given me the book. By the way, if you're a Muslim, can you send me a copy of the Injil? I lost mine. <laughs> you send me a copy of the Injil. I could really do with one right now. No, it's easy. Just look. I mean, you know, it's the original in GL, so You guys obviously have a copy because Allah protects all the books. Just send me one. Thanks. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Okay, so, 
So the story is basically altered to deny Christ the Son. Okay? And of course, the Quran says again, he will speak to the people in the cradle. So understand, they're simply borrowing all of these Gnostic texts. This, this is over. This is just a short sample. Now, let's look at the Nur Muhammadi, the light of Muhammad. <clears throat> the Prophet was born on Monday. Now, again, we need to go into Monday is the day of the moon, the day of the moon god. Even within Islam, it's the day of the moon god. And of course, a few people realize that the that's, just, again, a different set of slides. But remember when Muhammad had witchcraft cast upon him and he, he um, you know, so basically yep. he was bewitched. Okay, when he spoke the... Um, when he spoke about, when he said the satanic verses, when Muhammad spoke the satanic verses, he was bewitched by a demon called, or a jinn, okay, that's the story, but he was bewitched by a demon called Al-Abyad. Yep. Al-Abyad is the Lord of Monday. Right? The Lord of Monday. And of course, this demon gave him, gave him prophecy. Now, the demon may have bewitched him as well when he thought he was having, you know, relations with his wives and he wasn't, and who knows, but Muhammad was born on a Monday, he got revelation on a Monday, he went to the cave of Hira on a Monday, he did everything. Yeah. There are so many connections that the Muslims want to shove in your face that happened on a Monday, which is the day of the moon. And Al-Abiyad is also the, the demon, the, the king of the moon, the lord of the moon, the moon god. So I want people to catch this. Guys, I wrote an article on Abiyad. Okay, guys, listen to him. The stuff is so overwhelming and fascinating. You got to pay attention. And he's also working with the assumption, you know, a little bit about Islam. Muhammad is <clears throat> said, and here's the article. I wrote an article on this, that there was a genie, a demon that would <clears throat> come to Muhammad. And at times he'd appear as Gabriel and he was called El Abiyad, the white one. Here's my article where I quote authentic Muslim sources. Now, did you hear what he just said? Al Abiyad is the king of Monday. Monday is his day. Muhammad is born on a Monday, and Muhammad does, loves to do stuff on a Monday. And what's the connection with Al Abiyad with the moon again, so they can follow? Uh, let me just bring this up. Um, so Murad Al Abiyad is the jinn king of Monday and of the moon. Okay, he's the white one. He's the father of light. He's Abu Al Nur. Okay, or Mara, the white king, the Malik Al Abiyad. Okay, the moon is Qamar, which is also the name of a, of a pagan moon god. It is reported from Atta that Ibn Abbas said a devil called Al-Abiyad came to the Prophet and cast these words, the satanic verses upon him, and yep. the Prophet recited them. And this is Al-Abiyad here. Exactly. It's in that article that I gave you guys where I quote the sources. So you see the connection with Satan and the moon and Muhammad? And Al-Abiyad would appear as Gabriel and Muhammad couldn't tell the, the difference between the two. Continue, brother. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff. I'm not going to go into it. Monday is given such incredible importance, importance in the heavens. It is only right to give it equal importance. I mean, there's a whole host of things that Muslims insist are associated with Monday in Islam. But all of it has pagan connotations. All of it. Okay. So, of course, they can't agree about the day that Mo was born, but fine. So, it was the most auspicious day in the history of mankind when Mo was born. Okay. So, they speak here of only... so. When Muhammad was born and he got the name Muhammad, it was so auspicious because only three people in the entire history of Arabia had been called by the name Muhammad during the pre-Islamic period. Literally only three. See, because Jesus was a common name and therefore Muhammad was given the rarest of rare names. And they had been given this name since their parents had heard from the Jews and the Christians that a new prophet was to be born in the near future and that his name would be Muhammad. Very important to know that 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 you know that the mm -hmm. people before Muhammad that had been called Muhammad had been told by the Jews and Christians that a prophet called Muhammad was coming, right? Then once the caravan, so the Nuri Muhammad, the light of Muhammad, once the caravan reached Basra on the border of Syria, a Christian monk by the name of Bahira came to welcome the caravan. He walked past everyone and walked to Momo and holding in Mo's hand, he said, "This is the chief of the world and the messenger of the Lord." Allah has sent him as a mercy for all mankind. And people said, why do you say this? And Bahida said, when he came this side of the past, the stones and the trees bowed to Muhammad in prostration. They do not prostrate for anyone other than a prophet. I recognized him from the seal of prophethood, which lies like an apple on the soft bone below his shoulders. It is mentioned in the Christian scriptures. All right. Yeah, right. So one of the proofs of Muhammad's prophethood is that he had a hairy mole on his back. And I did a series on that. 
the mole on Muhammad's back was the proof he's a seal of the prophets. Well, hey, uh, yep. Lord, I got a small mole on my chin. What does that mean? I'm the seal of what? Seal of uh, buffoonery or buffet? But go ahead. Just... I have no idea. So hold on. Um, so I did some research. And this is the seal of the prophets. I checked. <laughs> Poor seal, man. <laughs> did some good. research. So <laughs> it's got the Islamic beard. So, so this is... Uh, poor seal. The seal oh, of the boy. prophets. I found it. Okay, so moving on. So, <laughs> oh, long know. before the creation of the world, Allah took a ray of light from the splendor of his own glory and united it to the body of Muhammad. It's in the Mila wa Nihal. So before the creation of the world, Allah made Muhammad out of Allah's own essence, saying, Thou art the elect, the chosen. I will make the members of thy family the guides to salvation. Don't forget, this is literally taken from what God says to Abraham. Yeah, exactly. Muhammad said, the first thing which Allah created was my light and my spirit. So Muhammad is the very first thing made by Allah. Blasphemy. Filthy blasphemy. So if Muhammad was the first thing that Allah made, if I were to follow the Gnostic understanding, just help me because I'm trying to piece this together. You have the monad and then you have the demiurge. Would this make Muhammad somehow the demiurge? You know, Islam makes no sense. I mean, exactly. it, just, it just twists my brain. Like, I mean, yeah, it makes no sense. honestly, okay. it makes no sense. Yeah. Okay. I they wondering. say these things, but it, it just it's like, oh my God, oh, but none of this is logical. So but notice in due time the world was created, but not until the birth of Muhammad did this ray of glory appear. It is well known to all Muslims as the Nur i Muhammadi. Now the Nur, the light of Muhammad, but hold on, they forgot to tell us that there are two words for light in Islam which are separate. Nur is moonlight, the moonlight of Muhammad, the Allah. Moonlight, Muhammad, moonlight, not sunlight, the moon, yeah, the moon, the moon. Connection with moon, yeah. Connection right. with the moon, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the so the, the nur is of four kinds, from the first kind, Allah created his throne, the second, the pen of fate, blah, blah, blah. Muhammad, the Muhammad of pre-existence was created of divine light, moonlight, right? Moon God, let's, let's, let's. When Muhammad had stood as a column of light before Allah for a million years in primordial adoration, Allah created Adam from the light of Muhammad. He created Adam from the clay of divine might, from the light of Muhammad. Adam was literally made from the substance of Muhammad. Muhammad is the clay that made Adam. My Have goodness. you seen this before, Sam? <clears throat> Not these details, no. <clears throat> so, Adam... Created from the light of Muhammad. My goodness. I mean, talk yeah. about the pit of blasphemy and how they're trying to supplant Jesus and his glory with this wicked demon. But go ahead, sir. So, so Muhammad, so basically the clay that God made Adam from, this was, he, it was literally Muhammad. Wow. Right? So it continues, not only Adam is formed from Muhammad's light, but the whole universe participates in this emanation. That is a Gnostic term. Because the, the monad emanates. It doesn't create. It emanates. Okay. And what so it I was emanates, onto something, right? I was onto something, brother. Because see, emanation. So monad and Muhammad is an emanation, right? So, and but, you get... But Muhammad is, is of the same substance as the father, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Everything it's else right. is a is of a lower order, you see? Because yeah. within the Gnostic thought, whatever is emanated is of a lesser substance. That's why within the Nicene Creed and within, the, within Nicaea and the other councils, they had to just speak of... Jesus is of the same essence as the Father, Homo Usias, of one substance. Because the, mon the Gnostics were saying, well, anything that was emanated from the monad is of a lower, lesser substance. And Jesus is therefore of a lesser substance. So now they're going, well, well, you know, Momo, no, 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 no. He's like he's like a piece of the actual real thing. Amazing. Amazing. So the light of the prophets, the moon al-Anbiya, Nur, again, is from Muhammad's light. The light of the prophets is from Muhammad's light, and the light of the heavenly kingdom, the Malakut, is from Muhammad's light, and the light of this world, the dunya, and of the world to come, is from his light, and the light of Allah's throne, called the Arsh, Allah's Arsh, is Muhammad's light. Excuse me, I, I thought I heard you say from Muhammad's ass, is that what you said? The the, the throne of Allah, the throone of oh, Allah. Oh, you said Arsh, not 
Aris, Aris. Okay, I'm sorry. Arsh. I apologize. So, the light of Muhammad's, the, the, the Arsh of Allah, the, whatever, yeah. it's Muhammad's light. I'm kidding with you. I just want it sounded too much like Aris, like ass, like a brain ass, you know, but you, I'm just. Get like, your mind out of the gutter, Sam. I mean, please, I know, you know, man. This is, we, we're talking theology here, you know. I'm sorry, man. I'm not part of the Gnostic group, man. I apologize. You know, I mean, yeah. seriously, we're talking about Muhammad. I think it's important that you have some respect. You're right, man. I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm a jahil, man. I'm not Gnostic. I, forgive me. You know? So, okay. <laughs> so notice this. There's emanations from Muhammad's light. Okay. And so on and so on and so on. Okay. So in the Kitabi Ahwal al Kiamat we spoke of, they created the light of Muhammad. Now notice, hold on. Someone sent this to me and I found this very interesting. Uh, okay. Hold on. While I'm here, let me, let me do something very briefly. So I'm going to come back to that. I want to show you this. Um, okay. This is a Brill, Brill, uh, Hermes Trismegistus on Arab science. So this is something that is known and discussed. Okay. Fine and well. Let's have a look at this one. I'm on page nine. This is a book called Secret Sex of Syria and the Lebanon. I've been to Lebanon. I've been to the border of Syria. Okay. Now, secret sex of Syria and the Lebanon, the consideration of their origin, creeds, and religious ceremonies, and the connection with and influence upon modern Freemasonry. Oh, wow. There you nothing go. to do with Islam, of course. No, yeah, okay. nothing. Oh, there you go again. Wow. The Syria and Lebanon, as we know. So let, let's have a look here at what this guy says, just briefly. So Freemasonry has been practiced as part and parcel of the religions of the Middle East for many thousands of years. That's the guy's claim. Look, I'm not here to evaluate his claims, but I understand there is so much evidence that talks about this, that... It's just ignored, okay? I'm, I'm starting to not ignore it. Syria in general and the mountains of Lebanon in particular of various ceremonial rites, manners, and customs with imitations, signs, passwords, and grips. We've discussed all of these within, a Suf, within Sufism and the allegorical and symbolical language employed. Didn't we just discuss this? Wow, yeah. And so this book is admitting this. Yes, he talks about this. Now, I'm not saying we should believe every word. Like I said, I have the speeding tickets to prove that I don't believe everything I read. Yeah, but exactly. that said, there is plenty of evidence that we cannot just ignore. So they speak of Templars who took part in the Crusades, right? And they, they people want to say, well, the Templars brought knowledge. And he says, no, 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 no. So they came in contact with some traces of masonry. We can see that on the contrary, <clears throat> the Templars found their own Masonic knowledge strengthened considerably by what they came in touch with in the East. Hmm. And they speak mm -hmm. here of, okay, um, the true source of Freemasonry, which extended by the influencing visits of Phoenician merchants, had been preserved and added to by the loving care of Alfred and Athelstan. We mentioned that the Freemasons took free, the Templars took Freemasonry into the UK, into London, and so on, and the UK through at the time of King Athelstan, as proved by reliable documents in the Bodleian Library. And there are documents in the Bodleian Library and the British Museum. So he is talking some degree of fact. And he speaks of Enoch, and I just wanted to mention that, okay? And besides the filial, this is called, this is about the epistles of the Brotherhood of Light or something like that, okay? This is the Muslim Brotherhood. The Ikhwan associated, okay, the Ikhwan, the Muslim Brotherhood, okay? The attainment of happiness with the scrupulous development of rational pursuits and intellectual quests. Besides the observance of the teachings of the Quran and the Hadith, they also appeal to the Torah of Judaism, the Gospels of Christianity, the legacies of the Stoics and of Pythagoras and Hermes Trismegistus. Yeah, once again. Hmm. Socrates, Plato, and Porphyry. Porphyry, remember when I showed the one? Porphyry was the student of, um, of Plotinus. Hmm. And Porphyry is the guy that was the, one of the very earliest people to criticize the book of Daniel. So basically, modern scholars who criticize the, the, right. the book of Daniel, they yeah. use the arguments from Porphyry, who hated Christianity, and of course, they, Plotinus, who was the, this, the teacher of Porphyry, and we mentioned that Plotinus was the guy that didn't ever have his picture made, right? Because he hated the material, so he didn't want a physical image, just like Muhammad. We don't have a physical image of Muhammad because it's a hatred of, of matter. So he did claim the book of Daniel was a forgery. Yeah, so, so there's a whole link there to all of this, and all of this links into Islam. Wow. So just wanted to mention that. And okay, so... <clears throat> Okay, so then we spoke of that. So they mention here that Muhammad, okay, the light of Muhammad was in a veil of white pearl of the shape of a peacock. Now, why is the peacock important? Well, because the peacock 
So we have to go to another Gnostic religion, the Yazidis. So then we have to go to the Yazidis. The Yazidis have a peacock god. So this thanks to someone in the chat who actually made in the comments who actually dropped me this information. I don't have all of it here, but the light of a peacock, the shape of a peacock, this is relevant to a pagan slash Gnostic god who's known as the peacock god, who's known as um, something Melek, oh. Tawat Melek. Okay? Well, to us Melek. So basically, this is a direct reference to a pagan Gnostic Yazidi god, who is also part and parcel of previous pagan religions. So the peacock symbolism is entirely pagan. So any so comment before I go on? Peacock actually is a symbol of a deity? Tawas Melek. It's like, I could be wrong, but it's like, um, you're going to find different spellings, but I think it's Tawas Melek or something, but you have to look up the Yazidis. The Yazidis, it's the main god of the Yazidis. And so the connection with Muhammad and the peacock, one, uh, your quote says what again about the peacock? It's right there. So it says that the, uh, let me read it. I was just reading it. Where did I see the peacock in your quote? I was just reading it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It. I see a oh, peacock. there it goes. So the light of Muhammad took the shape of a peacock. A pagan god. Yeah. So the peacock symbolism oh. is pagan. And it, you can link it back to Hermes Trismegistus and you can link it back to the pagans. Yes. Buddy. Don't you know Islam is pure monotheism? What are you talking about, man? Tawheed! Ahad! Oh, Ahad! <laughs> yes, Melek Tawas is tempting Adam and Eve in the garden. So, yes, Satan. You, do you understand how all of this comes around in a circle? Yeah, exactly. But it's Tawheed! Ahad! Ahad, man! One God, what are you talking about, Jahil? So, yeah, I'm so sorry, man. So, if you guys are bored, let me know how to stop. No, you're, you're blowing okay. people's mind away. They're like... So, so notice here, so here you've got now rank, okay, the ranking of people, so the Muslims versus everyone else, okay? So Allah created the people of believing men and women, the Muslims of both sexes, okay? So of the perspiration of Allah's eyebrows, Allah created the people of believing men and women, the Muslims, right? Of the perspiration of his ears, he created the spirits of the Jews and the Christians, okay? Fine, okay, so far, but it goes downhill rapidly. And then... Allah created the earth from west to the east. So you see, your soul was born long before the earth was made, and you were worshiping Muhammad for at least 100,000 years, not a million years, okay? But blasphemy. Depending on the story you're reading. After this, when the light of Muhammad had praised Allah for 70,000 years, Allah created the light of the prophets out of the light of Muhammad. And he looked upon the light and created their spirits. And they said, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the apostle of Allah. So all the spirits, all of your spirits, Tawusi Melek, yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. So, so, so notice that all the spirits Allah made, all of the souls, in other words, all of them said Shahada before they were born, before the world was created. And then Allah created a lamp and the figure of Muhammad. And then the spirits, all the souls, that means your soul, went around the light of Muhammad, praising Muhammad and worshipping Muhammad for a hundred thousand years. And then Allah commanded the spirits to look upon the form of Muhammad. And then some other nonsense happens. This is literally told in the seerah of Muhammad. It's, it's unbelievable that here Muslims, well, not all Muslims know, but the Muslim scholars who know this, know that they are worshippers of Muhammad. Muhammad has become a god. Yes. And you see, it claims that all of us as pre-existent spirits were worshipping and meditating on Muhammad because he's from the same essence of Allah, because he's from the light of Allah. And they tell us Islam is not pagan, polytheistic, it's not satanic, and that Muhammad is not worshipped. Garbage. Yes. So let's continue. So so then we, we saw here that you know Allah created the spirits of the Jews and the Christians from the perspiration of his ears. Okay, so th thanks Allah, appreciate it. But then notice that those who saw Muhammad's shadow, okay, those who didn't look, who gaze into the beautiful face of Muhammad, Okay, those who looked at his shadow became a singer and a player. Okay, but those who saw nothing, who refused to look at Momo, became a Jew and a Christian. Sure. So, yeah, just so you know, you're a Jew and a Christian because you refuse to look upon the beautiful countenance of Muhammad. After Muhammad was made flesh in paradise, you didn't look at him. So, yeah. And you also, so Jews, Christians, infidels, and magicians refuse to look at Muhammad. So you refuse to see the beauty of Muhammad. So that is why Muslims say Reva, because everyone originally said Shahada. In fact, you are literally made from the clay of Muhammad. Yeah. You are made yeah. from the essence of Muhammad.
the air you breathe is Muhammad. The sun you warms yeah. you, that warms you is Muhammad. Yeah, so he's replaced so, Jesus, basically. He's, uh, he's Yeah, so he's, he is reality. Muhammad, Muhammad is reality. Yeah, replace Jesus. So yeah. notice Muhammad, so Muhammad's mother says, okay, Muhammad fell into my hands at his birth and a voice reached my ears saying, the Lord show mercy unto thee. And the face of the earth became so illuminated from the light of Muhammad that I could see some of the palaces of Damascus by that light. It's only about 1,300 kilometers from Mecca, but okay, if you say so. All right, so that's Muhammad's mom, when Momo was born. And the light of Muhammad's prophetship was the first created thing. Okay, the first thing Allah made was Muhammad. Muhammad's light. Let's have a look here. Sorry this is so small. The nur, when the nur, the light is created. So Allah first created the nur, the light of Muhammad. Allah created, first of all, the light of Muhammad. And then Allah says to Momo, it is because of you that I am going to create the earth and the skies. I'm going to lay down the law, reward and punishment, and bring into being the garden and the fire. Allah makes reality for Muhammad. Allah creates paradise for Muhammad. Allah makes earth for Muhammad. And then there's the covenant taken from the soul, which combined the belief in the one God with acceptance of Muhammad's prophethood. In other words, you said Shahada before you were born, right? Yeah. And then Muhammad says, in fact, in the Hadith, he says, I was a prophet when Adam was between soul and body. Right. There is a Muhammad hadith. was born before Adam. Muhammad is the first man. Muhammad's light adorned the throne of Allah, the Ash here. Yeah, he adorned the ass. Okay, go ahead. The ass of Allah. Yeah, exactly. The ass okay. of Allah. Okay. <laughs> when Muhammad's mom says, when Muhammad was born, there was a light that issued out of my VJJ, which lit the palaces of Syria. We're looking at 1,300 kilometers, okay? And significant precursors accompanied Muhammad's birth, signs of at Muhammad's birth. 14 galleries of Chosro's, Caesar's palace cracked and rolled down. The Magians, the, the, the Iranians, their sacred fire died down and some churches on Lake Sawa sank down and collapsed. Sure. When Mo was born, all of these things happened. So sure. basically... The whole point of this is that they must expose the corruption in the Christians' books and explain the true teachings. So, yeah, blah, blah, blah. So, so basically, I'll, I'll, I'm going to skip over a bunch of this stuff. But does this all make sense? Anything you want to say here? No. <clears throat> I'm just glad that you're highlighting these are Muslim sources. Everything he gave you guys. And I just linked to his hard drive. I linked to his YouTube hard drive. <clears throat> this information, he makes it available. YouTube channel. You need to pray for him and support him financially to do this work by the grace of God. This stuff is out of the world, brethren. He's done the work. You don't need to go get all these books and get these citations. But these are Muslim biographies, the Sira literature, written by Muslims, not written by Islamophobes. <clears throat> In the Muslim sources, you see they're making Muhammad a god. Authentic Muslim biographies, brethren. Don't let yep. the Muslims lie to you anymore. He is a god. They are Mohammedans. Go ahead, brother. I just want to this is their sources, and Mark Lom says 13 kilometers. No, 1,300 kilometers. 1,300 kilometers. Okay, so I'm skipping a section, but this is basically where they, this is the most popular, the two most popular books on polemics against Christianity and Islam, and they all claim the Christian sources are corrupt. Corrupt, corrupt, corrupt. But let me read this. This is from Ibn Qayyim's book. The prayer of the Christians ridicules the worshipped deity. Christians chose a way of prayer during which the most devoted and ascetic amongst the Christians would consider it no great matter if he happens to pass urine dripping on his thighs and legs. Uh, so Christians are happy to, to, to urinate on themselves in church while praying. Then he would take direction of the east, make the sign of the cross, and worship the crucified deity. And then the Christian would open a conversation in church with whomever he happens to be sitting beside him. He would probably chat about some mundane matters like the price of wine or pork. Who won in gambling and what dish he prepared at home and the like. Or the Christian would uh, even interrupt his prayer to talk about similar things. This is in church, right? We would interrupt our prayer and then urinate in our seat if we can. This is this what is, the Muslim is saying about us? This is, this is a very popular book today. This is, this is an 800-year-old book that is extremely popular today. That's how they describe us, huh? And uh, the way yes. we worship in church, right? We literally, quite literally, excuse my French, piss on ourselves in church with urine running down our legs onto the floor. Yeah. This That's is what we do in church. You see the slander of these Mohammedan pagans? May the Lord Jesus silence them and teach them the fear of the Lord. 
No, this is what they literally teach. These are so okay from the Sharia, and then I'm going to jump back to after this. I'm just going to jump straight to the end to finish up our section that we finished last time on. So this is the Ijma. This is the Islamic consensus. This is what the four schools of Islam teach. This is what the highest scholars have decided is the the final orthodox interpretation. They speak of previously revealed religions were valid in their own eras, but were abrogated by the universal message of Islam, as is attested to by the Quran. So they say there are many English-speaking Muslims who are exposed to erroneous theories advanced by some teachers and Quran translators, affirming these religions' validity. Right? That's Christianity. But denying or not mentioning their abrogation, or that it is unbelief, it is kufr, to hold that the remnant cults now bearing the names of formerly valid religions such as Christianity or Judaism are acceptable to Allah. Right? So they... Muslims must understand that these formerly valid religions, which are remnant cults, are no longer acceptable to Allah after he sent Muhammad. This is a matter over which there is no disagreement among Islamic scholars. So the whole idea of ecumenicism, whatever, bridge building, this, this is a farce. It's a complete joke. You cannot, mm. because the, the, the Ijma states bluntly that we are the deen al battle. That we are abrogated, we are done, we are remnant cults that refuse to bow down to Muhammad. So that is part one done, and now we've seen this. Okay, so we've seen this, and now I'm going to go on to you. Look at this guy's uh, thousand yard stare, and notice how Hitler here, right, looks intimidated wow. by this guy. Notice yeah, that? yeah, exactly. Look at like, Hitler's adoring but frightened stare against this guy. Yeah, this guy yeah. looks insane. I mean, look at his eyes. Yeah, demonic. You can see there he's demonized. Look at them eyes. Wow. Yeah, look at this guy. Look at the face here. Yeah. What do you get out of that face? Yeah. And he, looks like, he looks like a demon just giggling. Demonic, uh, like, yeah, yeah. They're, yeah. They're demonized, obviously. Yeah. So we've discussed this, Rosicrucianism. We've discussed the Sufi practices in the previous show. So I'm just going to run ahead. We've spoken about this guy, Baphomet, about how this is Muhammad. We've, okay, so on this, a couple of slides that I've missed, and we'll just go to the end. We're nearly done. There have been attempts to see the world, the word as evidence. Okay, French Templars to French Cathars. So there have been attempts to see the word as evidence that Templars were actually secret Gnostics, which they were, adhering to ancient schools of thought, which were regarded as horrific heresies by the Catholic Church. Okay, so the Knights Templar was a group of men. So such ideas returned to prominence in medieval Europe with the rise of the Cathars, a neo-Gnostic movement that became for the Catholic Church extremely powerful and worryingly so in southern France. The Cathars were brutally persecuted and suppressed, much like the Templars themselves. Now look, this is whatever propaganda, blah, blah. The Knights Templar was a group of mainly French Christian crusaders who fought various religious wars against the Saracen Muslims from 1118 until 1312 when Pope Clement V disbanded the order under pressure from King Philip IV of France. And as you know, the Catholics are the bad guys here, only. And yeah. no other story shall be entertained, okay? Except yeah. the Templars, as we discussed before, became the bad guys. Let's have a quick look through this. So through their exposure to Islam, okay, hold on, I need to fix that slide. There's something wrong there. Through their exposure to Islam at the time of the Crusades, the Knights Templar began to explore Islamic customs. The most significant being the adopted worship of a deity known as Baphomet, a derivation of Mahomet or Muhammad. Yep. Right? Conversion to Islam in the Albigensian Crusade. I'll skip over that. So, Joseph von Hammer Purikstal, a 19th century historian and expert on Middle Eastern lit, believed that the word Baphomet derived not from Muhammad, but from a combination of Greek words meaning baptism of the spirit, which is again, you can trace that back to the Gnostics. That's another story. But von Hammer Purikstal, took this to refer to Gnostic rituals of secret knowledge. He also pointed out evidence, medieval medals, vases, and figurines emblazoned with arcane symbols, which he claimed was proof the Templars were Gnostics. The Gnostic connection was revived when Dr. Hugh Schoenfield, thank you, Big Wall, one of the scholars who analyzed the Dead Sea Scrolls after they were discovered in the 40s, applied the Hebrew Atbash cipher to the word Baphomet, a simple substitution cipher used to encode words by replacing each letter of the alphabet with another. He believed the cipher revealed Baphomet to be a coded translation for Sophia. Uh, the Gnostic. Yep. The divine Gnostic. figure in Gnostic mysticism. And what did we say was Sophia? Sophia 
Remember, Sophia is the Lataif. That's right. Right? Latifa, yeah. Lilith. So we're That's coming right. full circle again. So she's also synonymous with goddess. Hold on, Sophia, goddess, Lilith, goddess. Now, something that might be interesting to the audience, um, Samuel's tell me when to stop and shut up and call it a day. Oh, you, know. you finish, finish your presentation, brother, and then, Lord willing, next week you come and do another presentation. Sure. Try to do this weekly. If I'm out of town, I'll let you know because I want you to do as much as you can, a full series, finish it, and, yeah. you know, because this is what I want, not only for my channel so that people can get to know you and come to your channel and support you. So, Sam, let me look. I'm saying a lot of things here. I'm making a very much, I'm making a number of very blunt statements. I'm going against the standard narrative of Islam. I mean, how is this information striking you as someone who's been in this industry for a long time, who knows the standard story? I mean, my yeah. evidence, my, what are your thoughts here? here? Here's the thing. I had focused so much on the theological challenges of Islam to Christianity. That was where I got attacked. So I want, thank you for asking me a question because I want people to understand. My focus on Islam was to try to destroy their attacks against Christianity theologically and turn the arguments against them. <clears throat> what you have done, you've gone to the root of the problem. You've shown its satanic, pagan origins, Gnosticism. And then you've shown how Islam is really the driving satanic force behind modern <clears throat> occult and cultic movements like masonry. So what you've done, you've taken it on a level that I haven't seen. I'm not saying this to butter you up. I mean this. You've taken on a level I haven't seen any other Christian apologists take it. Most Christians will focus on the Quranic manuscripts that are not uniform, their corruptions, or why the Hadith literature is not sound and the Syria literature is not sound and why the theology of Islam is irrational. That's our focus. What you did was you showed its roots in Satan himself, because Gnosticism is Satanism, right? And how it is the driving force behind the occultic movements today, something I have not seen anyone do. This is why I truly thank the Lord that he raised you up, because this information needs to be known. People keep thinking it's a Catholic church that's behind, you know, the Jesuits. It's behind this one world conspiracy. And the Jesuits are the ones that are controlling in reality, what you're saying was something that a former Muslim said, but he never went in detail. Maybe you need to look for, look him up, Sam Solomon. He didn't. He was a private figure because he didn't want to get killed. Then he now came out publicly. He actually said in one lecture I heard, but he didn't go into the detail that you did. He just mentioned Islam is the driving force behind this one world conspiracy, the occults and all that. But he never went into detail. So I just, you know, brushed it aside. You have now given the facts. It's mind-blowing. That's why everyone's blown, because no one talks about this. Nobody. And your level of research will be hard to keep up with or match, because by the time I learn this stuff, it's going to take too long. So that's why I thank God you're here, and I can always access you and point people to your material, because I'm a little late in the game. I'm 50, brother. I don't know if I could... Take this in and master it the way you have, because this has been your focus, and I thank God for that. Thank you. This is historical. I am utilizing the best academic sources I can find. I'm aware they are very bad academic sources. I'm aware they are biased sources, but I I have the tools and you know to to sort through this, sift through this, you know. And thank you, Sam. I appreciate that. So moving on. So now you've got the Sophia. Now few people realize that when you look at some of the writings of the Sufis, right? The Sufis are at the top level. Remember, we mentioned these four levels. The Sufis are at the top level. And yes. to become a Sufi, before you can master this, remember the two divisions I mentioned? Like, uh, the, the Sharia and the Hakika. Yeah. Before, you, before you can become a true Sufi, right? The Sufi must first master the Sharia. Then he can earn knowledge of the Hakika. So he's at the top, but he also masters both divisions and all four levels. But few people realize, ask yourself, Sam, just, just, to, just to, from a symbolic point of view, in Islam, men wear white, women wear black. Yeah. Right? Why is the why is the Kaaba covered in a niqab? Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, it is covered. See, the, even people don't think of that. It has a covering. Right? Yeah. Now, there, there's more to say about this story, but on top of that, okay, the, the, the Kaaba is covered in a niqab and fine and well. But then the Sufis tell you that at its 
core, at his core, Allah is a female. I need to, you need to understand this. They say that Allah's external essence is male, but at the essence, Allah is a female. Wow. Okay. This claim is said. I'm not saying now it's widely this. Look, the, the claim is made. It's in the text. I found it. Okay. So they say Allah is female. Now, if this is true, I'm not saying it is, but look, I'm just saying it's written somewhere. Someone said it. Okay. If this is true, you know, understand that this, there are things about Islam that we don't know, but they claim that there's a duality to Allah. Oh, wow. So that's why the gender distinction is being blurred because he's male and female, external male, internal female. Yeah. So there's some weirdness. Now, look, again, I need to look deeper into this. I need to go back to these sources. I haven't, I don't have time to look at everything, but understand one time when I have time, I'll, you know, I need to start digging into this, this whole idea. So, okay. So on this point, okay. So the iconic image of Baphomet was invented abruptly by one man, a French occultist named Eliphas Levi in the mid 19th century, right? And this started to cause confusion with the whole Baphomet idea. So he made up the winged goat creature version of Baphomet, considering the pantheistic and magical figure of the absolute rather than a representation of Satan. Okay, it's become to mean Satan, Baphomet, right? Each part of the image had symbolic significance. He drew inspiration from Greek mythology, the half goat deity of Pan, as well as attributes of the divine set out by Kabbalah. And of course, there's Arabic Kabbalah as well. So maybe they don't mean Jewish Kabbalah. Hmm. Okay. And then, of course, we've mentioned some of this stuff that this author of Sufi tradition and magic argued that Baphomet came from the Arabic world, word Abu Fihamat, meaning the father of understanding. And the understanding is the fiqh. It is also the, the ulama have the understanding. Right. So there's lots of lots of interesting things here. So now Baphomet. We've mentioned Baphomet before. This is Baphomet with the crescent and the star, right? So we'll skip over this because I've covered this. So please look at the previous episode to look more at this. So the Baphomet was the goat idol of the Templars, okay? The Baphomet was a monstrous head, okay? A pantheistic and magical figure of the absolute, right? Another charge against the Templars was, the, was, was proved by the depositions of witnesses, because they had a ceremony where they said, adore this head. This head is your Allah and your Muhammad. Wow. Right. And the figure of Baphomet, we've mentioned, they would shout, Hala, right? A word of this, Sarasans, right? So you blew me we again. Wait, uh, we read this in the first part, but again, hearing it a second time again, you blew me away. So this is your Hala and your Muhammad, the head, huh? Yeah, this is. So look, half the, if you read if you read the popular discussions of the, the, the Templars, half the historians will go, well, you know, the Catholic Church, you know, they, they were just basically just, just villains and they they, they killed the, the, the Templars and that was horrible. Oh, my God. And then you can read the other half that they don't talk about. And those guys are like, look, these are the accusations made about the Templars for a century. People were getting distrustful of the Templars. People were accusing them of treason. People were accusing them of all sorts of crimes. The Templars were incredibly unpopular and the Templars was just a matter of time. So, so the Templars eventually stepped over a boundary and it was like, okay, fine. So, so there's, there was a lot going wrong within the Templars. Now, let's have a quick look. So we've discussed the Templars had secretly embraced Mohammedanism. Okay. Um, let's continue. So expressions regard the worthiness of Saras nations, among whom the Templars had many friends. Okay. The Templars had friends amongst the Muslims. It is even possible that the Templars introduced into their rites practices which saved up Gnosticism or Mohammedanism. Oh. Okay. And this encyclopedia is telling us that the Templars started to embrace Islam. Okay, fine. Let's continue. Uh, let's. So now this is the modern Templar order. Okay, the Templars have been revived. Long story, blah, blah, blah. Muslims in membership of the Templar order. The Muslim Saracen Knights of Arabian chivalry to defend all faith. So peace and cooperation between the Knights Templar and the Muslim Saracen Knights to defend all faith. Because as you know, why can't we all just get along, hug a tree and get along? Compromising Muslims anyway. were in fact admitted to membership in the Templar order and the Sultan Salah Hadin. If you guys have watched the movie, you know, the one with um, Balian, right? The one that makes Salah Hadin look like he's a hero, right? I'm yes, Salah exactly. Yeah. So Salah Hadin himself was given the Templar knighting ceremony near Alexandria. The modern order of the Temple of Solomon orders honors the Treaty of Ramla of 1192 AD reconfirmed by the Treaty of Acre of 12, 1229 AD, establishing 
peace and cooperation between the Knights Templar and the Muslim Saracen Knights of Arabian chivalry. The hmm. Templar order was never against Islam. The historical record from the 12th century sources conclusively proves that the Templar order was never against Islam. Muslims were in fact admitted to the membership and the Sultan Salah Hadin himself was a Templar knight. How come they forgot to put that part in our history books about the Templars? Yeah, I wonder why. A lot of corruption and infiltration. May God preserve his church and his people. So this is the official heraldic coat of the arms of the Knights of the Order of Salah Hadin, recognized by and participating in the Templar Order under the Treaty of Ramla of 1192 AD. The crescent, the star, the horns of the bull, there goes. Templar hold, the Knights of the Order of Salah Hadin, Templars, Muslim Templars, yeah, because they're the good guys, aren't they? So, see, we're on the same side. So contrary to popularized misconceptions, the Templars understood that Muslims were not necessarily enemies, that the real enemies of Christ could even be evildoers pretending to be Christians, and that the enemies of Christ were generally the same as the enemies of Islam. You see, we're on the same side. Evildoers are people who are enemies of all faith, opposed to the principle of religion, and thus the enemies of God, because it's the same religion. Now, I should warn you that the Sufis basically have the claim that they are the synthesis of all religions. Yeah, yeah they do. That. They are the yeah. synthesis of all religions. You see, The Templars were never crusaders against Muslims and did not agree with any such philosophy. Rather, the Knights Templars were holy warriors fighting for good against evil, regardless of which religion was involved. This is according to the modern Knights Templar order, based on these documents that apparently date back to the 11th and 12th century. So the Templars, according to this, these sources at least, I mean, who knows how true they are, were Muslims. So, understand. Um, so look, notice that this is, a, this is from the Pope. This is um, one of the early um, condemnations of Freemasonry by the Catholic Church, by the Pope. The depravity of their opinions and the wickedness of their acts. As our predecessors have many times repeated, let no man think that he may for any reason whatsoever join the Masonic sect if he leaves, his, if he values his Catholic name and his eternal salvation as he ought to value them, let no one be deceived by a pretense of honesty. It may seem to some that Freemasons demand nothing and that is openly contrary to religion and morality. So that, sorry, that they demand nothing that is contrary to religion and morality. But as the whole principle and object of the sect lies in what is vicious and criminal, to join with the Freemasons in any way to help them cannot be lawful. Pope Leo XIII given at St. Peter's in Rome, the 20th day of April, 1884. There have been numerous such condemnations. So basically, the Catholic, and these have never been rescinded. Amen. Basically, a Catholic who joins the Freemasons has joined with evil and is no longer deemed a Catholic. There is an irreconcilability between Christian faith and Freemasonry. Let us remember that Christianity and Freemasonry are irreconcilable. Enrollment in one means separation from the other. Yep. You, you guys hear that? So it's not the Jesuits who are working through the Masons. The Catholic Church condemns Masonry as from the pit of hell. Keep that in mind, you guys who want to blame the Catholics for everything. Yeah. There's numerous we... others. This has been renewed and reviewed in, this, in the 1900s as well. So in the 20th century, you've got, you've got similar. In France, these polemics were adopted in several conspiracy theories. Okay, You had the anti-Masonic Jesuit Augustin Barrault. In his memoir, blah, 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 he maintained that the French Revolution had been the outcome of, Mas of a Masonic complot or conspiracy whose ideology he traced back to the Kabbalistic Freemasons, the Templars, the Cathars, the Gnostics, and eventually the Manichaeans. And we can link the Manichaeans to the Muslims, do that another day. We've yeah. mentioned this before, that the Sufis are an ancient spiritual Freemasonry. See the previous episode, please, on that. We've discussed this slide already. This is the, Remember the Bodleian Library? So this is about that, the Bodleian Library. So I won't go there now. We've spoken about the KKK. The holy book is the Koran. The Quran, KKK's yeah, exactly. original symbol is the crescent and star. That's right. KKK no, originally no. wore this red and white uniform and had the crescent and star as a symbol. Okay, Burning the cross is a sacrilege of the cross. Right? Now we've spoke, we spoke about this at length. I'm not going to go further into this. Okay, we spoke about the, the Shriners. Okay, and their influence in government and their their Islamic, their Islamic and also very pagan origins. 
fight the Abu Ben Adam shrine and how this guy was a Sufi. No surprise there. The Sufis keep cropping up everywhere, right? So how the first shrine in New York, I believe, was born. Okay, the Mecca Temple in New York, Mecca Temple. That's right. Now I'm the Masonic Sword of Allah. Let's have a look. This is the Black Flag of ISIS. The basically think Saudi Arabia. Have a look at this Masonic temple. Look at this guy wearing his fez. Look at this mason over here. I don't remember who this guy is. Someone told me who he was. I can't remember his name. But he's wearing his fez. Okay. He's wearing his shrine of fez. Do you see the minaret on the chair? The minaret symbolism on the chair? Yeah. That's an Islamic minaret on a Masonic lodge. Notice here the cross swords of Islam and notice here the cross Islamic swords on the desk at a Masonic lodge. Right? That might be, and notice also, few people realize that when America founded the Marines, America's first war to the shores of Tripoli was against Islamic pirates. Yes. Right? The remember Tripoli, Repo, because there's a song about the shore of Tripoli. They were attacking Muslim pirates, right? Because the Muslims, pirates, the first war that America ever fought was against Muslim pirates who were right. raiding and enslaving Americans. And notice, you see, the Jolly Roger, notice is actually derived from the black flag of Islam. Few people realize, if you overlay the two, look at that. It is the same flag. Yeah, six right there. See, this was the flag that the pirates flew, this Muslim flag, the, the black flag of Allah. And of course, because it just became, eventually it became this, the Jolly Roger. Right, now... Okay, so this is slightly circumstantial. I mean, I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't put too much stake into this. But the ninth degree of the Masons, apparently, okay, there are nine degrees of Sufism. Someone asked how many degrees in Sufism there were last week. There were nine degrees, okay? So notice here, nine degrees. This is apparently a, a Google icon or something that was once. But notice here, this is Masonic. This is the Masonic apron. Google obviously used this apparently for the Gmail symbol. I mean, lots of people have that idea that the Gmail... Email symbol is this, but notice here, this is very similar to the, to this Shriner symbolism. Okay. Now, finally, we're just about to finish the Islamic temple of California. Okay. So California. people have told me the name California needs to be looked into because apparently there's a history there. I have not looked into it, but there might just be something. So this is the Shriners and this is their book from 1915, March 13th, The Pilgrimage to Sacramento. The, to the Islam temple. The Islam temple, in this case, happens to be the government, the seat of the government. I think this is in California. California. Okay? So notice, here you've got the Shriners lined up and throwing all of the elected representatives out of the Californian assembly or whatever this is, the house of the government. Right? And they are now taking over the government of California. This is an this actual is. book where... Yes. The calling it Islam Temple, and it's in America? It's a genuine book, yes. Yeah, a genuine historical book, yes. There you go. 1915, huh? March 13, 1915. Pilgrimage to Sacramento. Do you guys see it? This is the actual book. Islam Temple, Pilgrimage to Sacramento, March 13, 1915. And isn't that the anagram that you're saying right there, Mason? Yeah, A-A-O. Ancient Arabic Order, Nobles of the Mystic Shrine, A Mason. It's an anagram of A Mason. So, completely normal activity. So, what does a crypto Muslim look like? Okay, I did not share my sound when we do this, but they go, hey, yeah, hey, yeah, they, they, okay. What is a crypto Muslim? Everyone talks about crypto Jews. Let's look at crypto Muslims. So, where, where is this happening, Sam? And what is this uh, centipede doing? That, those are Shriners, dude. Those are Shriners. Where are they, Sam? I mean, if they're Shriners, they're going to tell me this is taking place in America? America? Uh, okay, let's, let's have a look. Los Angeles. There you go, guys. There it is. The Shriners Arab Patrol, 1925, dancing with people looking on. Remember, nothing to do with Islam, right? Yeah, nothing. Absolutely nothing. Okay, patrol from Al Malalaika Temple, LA. Subjects, Al Malaika Temple, Los Angeles, ancient Arabic order, nobles of the mystic shrine. Just cosplay. Just cosplay. Don't worry about it. Let's have a look at some real Sufis doing some uh, similar dancing. 100%. Yeah. Okay, let's have a look at another one. Let's look at some Sufi circle dancing. Wow, same thing that these Shriners are doing. Yes. You see, but nothing to do with Islam, of course. Nothing to do with Islam. <laughs> nothing, yeah. 
Oh my goodness. Nothing. So, so basically, so where they get this, the Gnostic acts of John and circle dancing, I believe this is my last slide or something. Perhaps the most famous of these alternative rituals is the dance of Jesus and the apostles as portrayed in the apocryphal acts of John. In one section, the apostle John recalls how on the night before his arrest and crucifixion, Jesus commanded the apostles to form a circle around him and to dance as he sang a hymn to which they responded in a series of amens. And when these guys sing, you hear amen, 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 amen. you hear this, this, this whole, you know, as they, I didn't share my sound, but you'll, you'll get that. It's a clear allusion to the dance scene from the Acts of John is found in the Psalms of the Manichaeans who are Gnostics. And they are linked directly to Islam. That's another story for another day. And finish. Wow. Glory to Jesus Christ. And these two parts, he gave you the foundation for what's to come. Glory to Jesus Christ. Guys, please take these two parts, upload them, translate them, make them go viral. I provided the link to his YouTube channel. On his YouTube channel, there's about where he shares his hard drive with these documents and how you can support him financially. I really want to encourage you. There are a few people that I like to see be fully supported. Usama Dakdok and this brother, few of us are in full-time ministry, and the more we are able to devote ourselves entirely to this research, the better and easier it becomes. But if we get distracted by having to do something on the side to pay bills because we got to eat, that will take away time. So let's pray by the grace of God. Go to his YouTube channel, subscribe, join. You have Patreon, right? Um, no, I don't. I have coffee and okay. I've got YouTube membership. But I mean, look, as you can see, this is detailed. I do put a lot of time into research. Yes. I mean, you know. Because if they want to be regular, let's say monthly contributors, is there a way? Do you have a link on your YouTube channel or they just contact you on YouTube? Um, I have a link on, um, go to my description box in any of my videos. You'll find it there. And I mean, I would be very grateful. I do appreciate it. Thank you. I want to see you then. There's a few people that I think God has called in full-time ministry. I believe you're one of them because the work you do is extraordinary. We don't need someone like you to be occupied having to work a secular job to pay bills. If that's what God wants, it will be done. He doesn't need us. But there's some people that I believe need to be in ministry doing this full time to equip the saints. You're one of them. Osama Dr. What's another. And again, I hope that I'm not deceived that I believe God has called me full time ministry. His will be done. So go to his YouTube channel. <clears throat> Subscribe. Look in the description box because I'll give the link to his YouTube channel. And he has a hard drive. He's sharing all this material. Oh, I'm yeah. going to be regular at least once a week if his schedule might allow it. He's going to be a regular every week until he gives you all this information because I want my audience to know him and invite him to your channels because he goes to other channels. So if you, like, for example, you have Full Armor Apologetics, invite him, contact him. Let's make him go viral and become famous for the glory of Jesus, not for his praise. So now, brother, obviously you got more in the series. So next week, we'll try to keep it on Thursday, if that's okay. We're supposed to do it Thursday, but I have to go to a funeral. So I had to push it Wednesday. Any topic you want to discuss, and you can do multiple parts on any topic. So it doesn't have to be one topic, one session. You can take a topic, do two, three parts, be thorough. And then obviously this is your material. You can upload it to your YouTube channel. So I want Thank to encourage you. you. We're going to be praying for you. But any final comments on your part? Um, I'm just curious. What, what does the audience, what do you think of what I've presented? And what does the audience think? I mean, these are obviously not your standard run-of-the-mill story of Islam. But this is historical. It is yeah. heavily documented. I mean, there's no shortage of paperwork I can throw at people. Brother, you haven't um, been reading the comments uh, because you've been busy. If you go back and watch the comments, wow, mind-blowing, amazing. No way. You shocked the world. You know how Muhammad Ali said he shook up the world? You shook up the Islamic, Gnostic, Mason, Mason, how do you say, Masonry world. You've shocked. See, incredible. Read the comments. I'm astonished. Incredible. So, so that's why I know God is working through you because you are unleashing the onslaught on the kingdom of darkness by the power of the Holy Spirit. Like here, look at this guy, what he said. In two parts, united, you annihilated Islam. There you go, brother. You blew me away, man. You know, because my field is just refute Islam theologically. Because when I got attacked, so you entered it because you were on the ground. You were encountering terrorists and you were involved in anti-terrorist operations, as you stated. 
my field was, I got a Muslim attacking me saying my Bible is corrupt and Jesus is not God. So that became my focus. But you, because you saw the threat of Islam, that it's a threat politically, socially, economically, you decided to go to the root. Glory to God for that. Because you destroyed Islam. You showed it's from the pit of hell. It's Gnostic. It's pagan. And it is the driving force behind the occultic movement today. Guys, no exaggeration. Islam is Satan's favorite religion. And Muhammad is his favorite son. Because Satan's working through Islam to influence the occult. The occult The occult is not influencing Islam. Islam is influencing the occult. That's what you've proven. Uh, cool. Amazing. I mean, I hope it wasn't. Dull. I hope it all made sense that it all connected. That that the links are obvious. It's not. I mean, I'm not making tenuous connections. I'm. There's so much. I have to. It's hard sometimes to. How do I? How do I? Distill, reduce the amount of information. But but hopefully you can see everything connects here. Perfect. All connect. No, your your command and your communication perfect. We got it. But it's astonishing. So when you see us like that, it's because it, it is astonishing. I'm telling you, it's astonishing. And, and sadly, people don't know this stuff. That's what hurts. And Muslims know about the seerah. They obviously know Muhammad is a god. And this is why they, they hide it. They don't want to talk about it. But this is in their books. This is what they read in the mosque. This is what the kids are taught. And yet, you know, they want us to argue about Quran 9.5. But the fact is, I mean, we should go to the seerah and say, let's look at the Gospels of Muhammad and tell me, well, what is this? What is this saying? Am I reading this wrong? I mean, what are they going to tell us? You know, this is, Islam's been hiding this in our faces for so long. Yeah. But glory to Jesus, who's almighty. He raises up his servants to expose the darkness with his glorious light. So they can try to hide it. But Jesus is almighty over Satan and Muhammad. And he's exposing this filth because Jesus lives and Muhammad is in hell. Now, one thing, guys, you keep telling me the link is broken. There's nothing I can do. That's his link. I've been giving so... you... I will paste it again. I'll paste it in the chat. I mean, my research archive, if it's that. Yeah. This is my research it's... archive link. I don't know if it comes through. Yes. If you put it, uh, uh, if you, let me see where I want to make you a mod. So private if... chat. This is my archive link. Yeah. It won't show up. Just put a one in my set because I got to make you a mod and then you can do it. Just, okay. just say, put one or say, hey, hi, and I'll make you a mod of this channel. That means you can then post links anytime you want. Okay. There you go. Now, hold on. Let me know. Now you're a mod. Now you can post. You. Guys. That's his link. I don't know why it's not working. It was working for Kitty Adesun. But there it goes. Now he gave you the stuff. Pray for him. Go to his YouTube channel. Subscribe. Make his videos go viral. And try to support him financially and prayerfully. And he'll be back on and take the material. It's yours. So any final wrap up before we call it a day for now. God willing, he'll be back next week. No, well, thank you. I mean, I... Um... I appreciate the opportunity. I hope people learn from this, will use this, will confront Muslims with it. And I don't, I don't mean that in a negative way, but these, these are the facts. We need to tell them, look, this is the truth of what he's taught in your deen. Please explain this. Right? And, and we need to be, because we can't keep focusing on this one tiny narrow area that they want us to look at and ignore the mass of all this other evidence. Um, Islam cannot explain this. We, it's obvious what it means. So please use this. Um, take the attention away from this narrow focus they want us on and, and let people really understand this is what Islam is about. These sources are as valid as any other. Exactly, they are. They are so, the yes, yeah, thank you, Sam, and I, I appreciate it. And I, I mean, honestly, Muslims need to realize Islam is the most false of false things, and they honestly need to learn the Bible, the truth of the Bible, and they, they need to realize that, that Christianity is the only way forward. There Glory is to God. nothing in Islam that is good. Hallelujah. And again, God's timing is perfect, though I reached out. I reached out to him last year, but because of what was happening in my life, I didn't. I wasn't able to get him on. Glory to God for God's timing. He's now on. And like I said, my channel is your channel, not because I'm trying to use you. No, because your information is great, and I want my audience to be aware of you so you can build up your YouTube channel. You go viral. And when you go viral, then you're going to have to invite me to your channel so I can get more subscribers. That's what we hope. So we love you, brother. And thank, thank Jesus Christ for you. Next week again, sometime, God willing, next week he's going to come back to do another topic. He's got a lot of topics. He's got series on atheism and Sharia. I want him to share all that. So once a week, hopefully, and we'll try to keep it on Thursday unless his schedule changes or mine does. So, brother, God bless you. And Christ is risen. And we're going to be celebrating his resurrection. And because he lives, we live. 
Muhammad is dead and buried under the feet of Jesus. So we love you, brother. God bless you. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Bless. Okay. Let's end